three, two, one. Good evening. Welcome to the March 24th Northampton School Committee meeting. Uh, I'm Jean-Louis Chair. I'm the mayor and I am the chair. Um, and I'll be presiding this evening. This meeting is being held remotely on Zoom pursuant to the modification of the state's open meeting law for the COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting and all participating on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. I'll begin by asking the clerk to please call the roll of the school committee. Mayor Sciarra. Present. Member Robbins. Present. Member Gazy. Present. Member Serafi Cox. Present. Uh, Member Stein is not with us tonight. Member Levy. Did you say no. Member Levy? I did say Member Levy. Sorry, I froze for a second. Present. <laughs> Member Miller. Um, oh, uh, she, can you please make her a co-host? I am. Okay, okay present. Sorry, but, okay, present. Okay, thank you, Member Miller. Member Goldman. Present. Member Agna. Present. And I think Member Davis is going to be joining us a little later tonight. So you have a quorum, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you. We will now open up public comment. If you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature in the bottom menu bar under reactions. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, please turn on your camera and wave at me. Um, I'll be on the lookout for you and I'll ask other school committee. Oh, Annie, are you demonstrating Annie? I am. I just wanted to remind you, I don't know if you received my email, Mayor, about the first person that I asked you to have speak, this, uh, Mrs. Devlin yes, from the Rotary Club. Yeah, okay. I think she should probably go first. Okay, thank you. Um, so Annie just showed you what that looks like. Just wave at me and I'll be on the lookout if you're having trouble raising your hand. Um, uh, before you begin, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. I will set a three minute timer to ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to speak. And I ask that all but the school committee turn off your video until called upon because only the person recognized has the floor. Um, so we will start with public comment. Um, and it, it is true that uh, you can always send us public comment um, by email or in writing. And that is um, as much a part of the public record as speaking to us um, in person or over Zoom. So I am going to start with uh, Barbara Devlin, um, uh, who has a comment to make, and then we'll go in uh, the rest of the order. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, my name is Barbara Devlin. I live in South Hadley, but my daughter and her family live in Northampton, and I'm a member of the Northampton Rotary Club, and it's in that capacity than I'm here this evening. Um, you should have received a couple of documents from me about a tree planting project that's involving a couple of the elementary schools. And I thought you'd be very interested in that. For those who might not know anything about Rotary, it's an international organization in over 200 countries. We have about 35,000 clubs and 1.4 million members across the, wor uh, the world. And this year's international president uh, challenged all clubs throughout the world to do a day of, day of service in their communities. And the Rotary Clubs of Connecticut and Western Massachusetts have decided to do our day of service and, and each club is doing something different during the month of April. In keeping with Rotary International's newest area of focus, protecting the environment, um, our club has decided to do a tree planting project and we've been working with the city of Northampton, Tree Northampton, the Urban Forestry Commission and the schools to organize a tree planting that will be the morning of Saturday, April 16th at Jackson Street Elementary School and at RK Finn Ryan Road uh, Elementary School. We're just delighted that that has come to fruition. Um, we're responsible as Rotary Club for lining up volunteers, and of course we'll have many of our members and their family members, but we would also let, we, we are also welcoming uh, participation from the school communities, so we've had parents that have signed up with their families, and um, we would love to see some school committee members or uh, district and, and building administrators as well. A, a few uh, 
the building principal and uh, custodian have signed up so far, but we have and quite a few parents. So, um, so that's the main reason for being here. The flyer that you received has my email address. So if you're interested in volunteering, uh, we'd love to uh, get you involved. In addition to soliciting volunteers, we're also inviting contributions for uh, to the Northampton Rotary Foundation. Uh, all the proceeds for the tree project will go to purchase further trees and other tree related supplies. And we're also trying to help spread the word about the tree setback program that's available in the city. So I thank you for your time and hopefully I stayed under the three minutes and uh, I'd be happy to communicate further with any of you if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Um, okay, next up is Ellen Brown. There I am. Hi there, everybody. Hi. I'm Ellen Brown and I'm from Waitley, Massachusetts. I always appreciate being able to comment before the school committee. Thank you for this continued privilege. I'm here to speak about the proposed staffing changes to first grade, namely the suggested elimination of a first grade teacher at Jackson Street School, as well as the elimination of all the first grade floating ESPs who support first grade classrooms across the district. I am concerned that these proposals were based solely on numbers rather than educational quality and that these numbers were the driving force that created this plan. As a current first grade teacher and as an element early, early childhood educator for over 20 years, I think I can shed some light on what should be considered when making decisions about student teacher ratios in first grade. What are first grade students need? First graders need frequent physical and verbal contact with their caregivers, help with tying shoes, zipping zippers, buttoning buttons, opening food containers. They need reminders to use the bathroom, to sign up for lunch, to wash their hands, to put away their materials, to look at the speaker, to use their words, to not cut in line, to put their name on their paper, to use their social filter, to use whole body listening, to turn off their voice in the hallway, to be boss of their bodies, to put their snow pants on before their boots. First graders also need help when they have accidents, support with solving social conflicts, time to swing, spin, climb, dig, imagine, and explore. They need help solving social conflicts. They need a nurturing environment in order to take academic risks. They need a safe environment to share their fears, concerns, and worries. They need help with organizing personal belongings. They need support with understanding their feelings, their actions, their impact on others. They need access to an endless supply of Band-Aids. On top of all that, we're expecting first graders to move through six or more reading levels, to read and write over 120 sight words, to write personal narratives, opinion pieces, informational books, and realistic fiction. We expect them to count to 120, to read and write numerals to 120, to integrate dozens of reading strategies, to read with fluency and comprehension, to revise and edit their work, written work, to work independently or with a partner or with a small group with success, and to understand and use place value among other things. So you see, you're, if you really know what first graders need, You'll, you'll understand that numbers are important in first grade classrooms, but not the number of students in a first grade classroom. The number of adults needed to sufficiently, effectively, and compassionately educate and care for a diverse group of six and seven year olds that have endless needs and much to learn. Please do not support any budget that eliminates any teacher or ESP from the first grade in our district. Doing so will undermine the importance quality and effectiveness of our first grade curriculum and of our students' learning potential. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Mindy Haskins Rogers. Hi, thank you. Um, I won't be repetitive. I know I've spoken here before and I've emailed. Um, I'll just say again that I do hope that you will not cut the sixth grade um, down to two teams. Our 
kids have transitioned from childhood into tweendom, uh, basically in isolation, and um, have are making a jump to like greater academic demands with gaps in what they've in the support that they've received thus far, just because of the pandemic. So, just I hope that you'll keep those teachers and keep um, three teams so that they have all the support they'll need. I didn't know that the district was going to be looking at the masking again so soon. Um, I don't know if Meredith O'Leary has changed her guidance. Um, and I do think that Member Stein really outlined beautifully um, my concerns about removing masking at the last meeting. Um, I don't think we have to view this as pitting some students' needs against others because there have always been accommodations for students who can't tolerate masking or who have circumstances that um, mean that they need to to uh, have accommodations. So, but the other thing I would point out is that Concord, Massachusetts just had to completely shut down one of their middle schools after removing or making masks optional on their buses. Three weeks later, they had so many COVID cases and people too sick to teach or learn, and they had to just completely shut down the school. We know that BA2 is now prevalent in this region. Its RO factor is estimated to be about 12, meaning that one person in general will infect 12 other people. So if we have one unmasked kid in the classroom who gets this variant, we can expect that half the classroom will be infected by that one student if they're unmasked. Um, so I just think it's not quite time yet. And I hope that we will hold firm and just keep the masking until at least we can have windows open and maybe this next surge passes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, next is uh, uh, Human Wan. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Can you unmute? There you go. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Hui Min Wan of Northampton, and I'm currently teaching first grade at Jackson Street School. This is my second year teaching full time and my first year at Jackson Street, but not really my first year at Jackson Street. During the 2018 to 2019 school year, a student taught at Jackson Street School in first grade for the entire school year, six months of which was full time. The next school year, I spent six months substitute teaching in Northampton in the Northampton Elementary Schools. There are two things about myself that I would like to share. I am an early childhood educator, and I love Jackson Street School. As a queer, Jewish, Asian American woman, a school like Jackson Street is a dream. I applied for this job three years in a row, and it was a job worth fighting for and still is. While I appreciate the concerted effort to keep all current teachers in Northampton for the upcoming school year, my career is not teaching older students and my home is not at another Northampton elementary school. Teaching is an incredibly difficult craft to build and teaching fifth grade is simply not the same as teaching first. I hope next school year is another year that I can develop the skills needed to be a career early childhood educator. While one reason I hope my first grade section at Jackson Street is kept open is self-interest, I have 41 other reasons why I believe the third section should remain open. 41 is the current number of students in the upcoming first grade cohort, a number that is likely to go up, as this year we had 12 students join us for first grade who did not attend kindergarten at JSS. As a teacher in a mid post pandemic world, it is clear that early childhood learners are in need of more support than ever. With over two years of compromised social development, one third of these students' lives, learners are not only coming into first grade needing to learn to read, write, add, and subtract, they need to learn how to take turns talking to have a conversation, how to keep their bodies safe in a classroom with no leaping or flailing and watching where they're going. Time to learn that feedback is an essential part of the learning process and develop a growth mindset, and even more skills that are essential to success for the, in the rest of their academic careers. My first grade students this year do need more social emotional support than pre-pandemic first graders. First grade classes in a pandemic impacted world of over 20 students without the support of a floating ESP are not safe and will keep students from the learning time and attention they deserve. First graders are not just little kids. They are learners who are developing an understanding of what their identity as a student looks like. 
And this foundation is essential to their schooling as they continue throughout the grades. I ask that you support our early childhood community members and vote to reject the current budget proposal that eliminates a classroom teaching position at JSS and for four first grade ESPs at all the Northampton elementary schools. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Okay, next is Greg O'Donnell. Hello, how's everyone doing? Uh, first time here. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that I'm a longtime uh, um, parent of students at uh, Northampton uh, Elementary, Middle School, and High School. Um, and I just, in uh, reaction to uh, other people's um, talking about cutting staff, I feel like that would be very detrimental. Our, as we all know, our district has already had issues with uh, paying teachers lower than um, average. Uh, but I'm here uh, for something else because I'm a member of a new organization called Mask Choice Pioneer Valley. And I'm here to speak about the mask mandate. And this continued mask mandate is at odds with data, logic, and with science. And it's appalling to have spent years at odds with uh, different administrations who have uh, ignored science. And um, this council is disregarding data and science as you set policy. And instead you're setting the policy based on fears that aren't grounded in facts. You're pointing to studies that are outdated, discredited, or grounded in bogus assumptions, and that's not how good policy should be made. Uh, you're also justifying outlier position based on the rise of a new COVID variant. Um, there's a Dr. Liana Wen, who's an emergency physician and professor of health policy at George Washington University, who stated recently two days ago on CNN that this new BA2 variant does not seem to cause more severe illness than the BA1 variant. And researchers from the United Kingdom and Denmark have found that BA2 causes less level of hospitalization that's com comparable to that of the BA1, which is less likely to result in severe illness than the previously dominant variants that we've seen. And in addition, we have vaccines that are still effective. Um, so I just like to say Northampton School Council and for the town of Northampton, it's time to follow science and 98% of our other districts within our state and even within uh, the national levels do, do not uh, have these mass mandates and make it optional for kids. So. That's what I'm here to say. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Next is Kamini Waldman. Hello, can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Mayor, Superintendent, and School Committee members. My name is Kamini Waldman, and I am a senior at NHS. I am also the current president of the Student Union and have been a member throughout all my four years at NHS. I'm here today to read a statement on behalf of the Student Union, so this right now is that statement. To the students and stakeholders of the NHS community, in light of the recently published articles in the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and the student-led and organized walkout, the Northampton High School Student Union feels it's necessary to address the comments made by Principal Valancourt regarding union members and our efforts concerning embedded honors classes at the high school. Discontent with the actions and words of Principal Valancourt has been building for the past few years. We look to our principal to create a culture of respect and care and to be a role model in, a, in compassionate communication, especially in moments of frustration. Firstly, we would like to clarify our stance on embedded honors as the sentiments of the union were misconstrued in statements made to the Gazette, which were quoted in the article. While we did discuss the implementation of embedded honors at the high school over a series of union meetings, the student union never took an official position for or against the initiative. Secondly, the report on embedded honors compiled by former school committee member Susan Voss highlights the use of a derogatory and insulting term made in reference to student union members. This comment and others like it are upsetting, but not our main concern. Comments included in the report implied that through the use of the word equity, the student union would, without question, agree and support anything brought to the table. Using equity to intentionally mislead us in order to gain our approval for embedded honors is manipulative and dismissive of the work that the union does. Additionally, it is not in alignment with the goals and values of our district. Equity is not an empty word. It is a set of continuous actions to create an environment where every student feels safe, cared for, and supportive, supported, both academically and emotionally. Equity loses meaning when used to accelerate and promote an agenda. 
Finally, we hope that this report, along with the recent walkout organized by our peers, will spark a community dialogue regarding how distressing and unacceptable the school climate inside Northampton High School has become. The student union looks to the school committee and the superintendent to take the necessary actions that will lead to the revival of a safe and respectful Northampton High School environment for all stakeholders. Thank you so much, committee members, for all the work you have done and continue to do. Um, and the statement will also be emailed to all of you uh, to look back on. Thank you. Next is Tali Serlin. Hi, everybody. Um, hello, Mayor, Superintendent, and School Committee, committee members. My name is Tali Serlin, and I'm a senior at Northampton High School, as well as the Vice President of the Student Union. I'm speaking today in hopes of clarifying what seems to have become a misunderstanding regarding the Student Union's willingness to meet with Principal Valancourt following the Gazette article that was recently published. There seems to be a narrative that the Union flat out denied to meet with Ms. Valancourt. This is not true. The student union values connection and communication with our administration. Open communication strengthens our relationships and helps us be their advocates for the students at NHS. This being said, what the union did ask for was to have more time to process recent events together and as a school community before meeting with Ms. Valancourt. Three cabinet members received an email from Ms. Valancourt Sunday evening of the weekend the Gazette article was published with a request to meet the next day, a Monday, at the start of school, which would have been nine o'clock. Community Waldman, the union's president, responded both thanking Principal Valancourt for her email and explaining that the union needed time to process, but that we would reach out soon regarding next steps. That Monday afternoon, the union held an emergency meeting and following that, our faculty advisor reached out to schedule a meeting with our principal. We got the response that she would be out for the rest of the week. Later that week, Kamini received an email from our associate principal extending an invitation to meet and offering support to student union members. That meeting is now scheduled for next Tuesday during our flex block period. If it is helpful, the union can provide documentation for how all of this unfolded. We look forward to working with the administration to address the many long-standing and serious concerns that the student body and student union have and share. Thank you so much for your hard work at this stressful time with these complex situations. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Tali. Okay, next is Brianne Schwartz. Hello, my name is Brianne Schwartz. I want to thank you for this opportunity. I am a speech therapist and I have a private practice in Northampton. I also have a kindergartner who attends Ryan Road. A little more about myself. I have been working with children and fam families for over 17 years. I am a longstanding member of the American Speech Language Hearing Association. And I have a master's in speech pathology from Columbia University. After the committee voted against going mask optional and against the vast majority of what the school committee, what the school community wanted, I hesitated to speak up. But then I heard some comments that masks don't matter, that the kids have gotten used to them, so there's no need for change. That's what fueled me to write my article that was published in the Gazette. Masks really do matter, especially for our kids who are learning under extreme circumstances. I am not against masks. In fact, my family has been very cautious, but it is time to move forward with change. There is compelling research about how masks muffle the sound frequencies of human speech. They decrease volume and hide visual cues, like looking at a person's mouth and their facial expressions. We don't realize how important these cues are until they are missing. Kids learn essentially everything through communication. When communication is blocked in some way, 
so is learning and social development. Mask wearing has gone on for so long that it has become a hindrance at best and an imposed learning disability at worst. My students with communication delays face some of the biggest risks. I receive multiple calls every week from concerned parents. Communication problems are growing and so is my wait list. At this point in time, the risks of continu continuing the mask mandate far outweigh the benefits. We have met every requirement set forth by the CDC guidelines and at the federal and state level. Why would we keep masks on any longer than is needed? We have asked so much of our kids and they've shown us their resilience. My ask is that we go mask optional while we have this chance. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next is Joe Pater. Thank you. Sorry, it's a little dark here. Um, so my name is Joe Pater. I am a Northampton resident and at first uh, and father of, of two NPS students. I'd first like to thank the school committee for all the work that you're doing for all of us. Um, and I'd like to thank you for the decision you made last week on the mask policy. You made the decision that protects families with vulnerable members and ensures their continued access to public education. I read the Gazette report of it, and I wanted to point out that by the CDC metric that is on the Northampton Health Department website, Hampshire County is not at a low level of COVID transmission as is stated in that article, but is instead at high and the rates are currently rising. This level is twice as high as the threshold that a recent article in Inside Medicine recommends for universal indoor masking for the protection of immune compromised members of our community. Um, I'd also like to point out that the community survey that was discussed last week and reported in the article um, asked how comfortable people were with dropping the mask mandate. It did not ask whether they wanted the mask mandate to be removed. And I'd like the school committee to consider what the result might have been if instead of asking how comfortable people were with the mask mandate being dropped, if it had asked how comfortable people were with the mask mandate being kept. Thank you very much for giving me this time to speak with you. Thank you. Okay, next is Emily Body. Hello, hi. Thank you for listening to me this evening. I am Emily Body, and I'm a resident of Northampton and a parent, and I'm also a co-founder of Mask Choice Pioneer Valley. I am asking that our schools follow the science and data that has caused the vast majority of schools around the country to drop their mask mandates. It is time to go mask optional without delay. This position is supported by four main points. One, the Department of Education and the Center for Disease Control have shown the path forward. Now is the time. The vast majority of schools in the state, around 97%, have gone mask optional. The Northampton Board of Health has lifted the mask mandate in town. It is time without delay to allow children the same choice in school. Kids are counting on the adults in the communities to follow science and reason when implementing policies that affect them. Two, vaccines are easily accessed and are highly effective in protecting in severe disease. And we're even seeing that now with the BA2 variant and as are the now widely available therapeutics. Furthermore, many scientists are encouraging one-way masking. This includes Ajish Jha, the newly appointed COVID-19 czar, whereby the well-fitted mask protects the wearer. People who feel they're at higher risk can choose to protect themselves in this way while affording choice to everyone. Three, many children are struggling with perpetual masking. 
The negative implications of masking and other pandemic restrictions for children are growing increasingly more clear. They impact literacy, speech, emotional regulation, and connections with peers, and certainly the list doesn't end there. We must weigh the harms when we call for universal masking, and especially when optional masking is now the norm. While some parents report that kids are fine with masks, we have children among us who struggle immensely and for myriad reasons. The struggle is especially profound for children who are hard of hearing, who are learning to read, who have speech issues, English language learners, and those children among us with social, emotional, and mental health challenges. Just like their neighbors in East Hampton, South Hampton, Amherst, Hadley, Hatfield, Waitley, Smith Folk, I could go on, these children deserve mask choice. And four, we have an urgency of normal for our children. Children are at the lowest risk, and yet they are experiencing disproportionate restrictions and at a cost. Our children and their teachers deserve to have the option to see each other's smiles and to see each other's faces. They need a return to casual chat and banter in the lunchroom. They need and deserve a normal school experience. Some teachers and families may be worried about the next step. I hear that. But remember, the way families and teachers felt comfortable returning to in-person learning was by returning to in-person learning. The same will apply here. We must practice empathy and compassion, but we cannot let fear drive our policy. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ronnie Gold. Oh, Ronnie, you muted yourself again, hold on. Okay, unmute. All right, great. Um, good evening and thank you for the time to speak with you tonight on three of your votes on the agenda. Regarding the mask policy vote, please support the health director's updated recommendation you will hear about tonight and lift the man ma mask mandate starting this coming Monday. And please do not force our community to wait any longer. I remember when, when I was on school committee during the August 2020 vote on if we should start the year in the hybrid model or remotely. Unfortunately, the school committee voted to start remote, remotely putting fears of in-person learning ahead of science and the advice of the health and education professionals. Soon after we started remote learning, after seeing how in many other communities, the fears our community had went unfounded and the advice of the health and educational prof professionals was proven correct, many in our community and on the school committee shifted their stance and began advocating for expediting our move to hybrid as soon as possible. When the hybrid vote came up in October, some in our community said, much like we're hearing now regarding masking, that we would be jeopardizing the health of our most vulnerable students and hybrid would come at a heavy cost to our community, just as member Stein wrote in the Gazette during that vote. Thankfully, rational minds prevailed and we finally moved to hybrid and once again, fears went unfounded and the advice of the health and educational leadership was correct. And we successfully moved to hybrid though, unfortunately later than we should have. Please do not repeat our regrettable decisions of the past to delay listening to the advice of our health and education professionals. Regarding, regarding the vote to refer embedded, the embedded math program to the curriculum subcommittee, I strongly ask you to vote no on this. Member Agna, while I was on school committee, I remember you coming repeatedly to ask us to respect the alt team as the professionals and leaders they are, to listen and respect to their decisions and how insulted and hurt you and the other administrators were when school committee questioned your expertise. As you know, I shared these same feelings with you. I've also heard each other's current school committee member speak of how you respect our teachers as professionals, yet you are allowing the professionalism of Northampton's math department and all teachers to be questioned and degraded by a former disgruntled school committee member who dug through emails instead of speaking to the math department which if she had, she would have learned why all the, of the math department supports this embedded program. Instead of questioning our math department, we should be celebrating them for taking the leap to what is cutting edge practices in high school math instruction. We should give them the fair time to try to learn and adjust and grow as professionals. Our school committee and Dr. Provost should publicly in a letter to the Gazette, strongly support our education professionals and end this questioning of their professionalism now. 
And lastly, regarding the budget, please do not approve the budget until you have a chance to clearly hear from the district administration and teachers at JFK regarding the reworking of, grade, of the sixth grade. Yesterday at the curriculum subcommittee, the teachers very thoughtfully presented their concerns, but we still have not had a chance to hear from the principal, and so the, the picture is incomplete. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, next is Maya Williams. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, Superintendent, and School Committee. My name is Maya Williams, and I'm a senior currently attending Northampton High School. I have two siblings currently enrolled in the Northampton Public School System as well. One of them is a junior attending Northampton High School. The other is a sixth grader attending JFK Middle School. As we are all rather aware, the percentage of students of color, whether it be who attend the high school, the middle school, or even one of the elementary schools is very low. Both of my siblings, along with myself, are students of color. Attending a school with both predominantly white students and administration proves a daily difficulty as it is. Our representation is slim to none, causing our voices, which are already generally tuned out by administration, especially and specifically by Principal Valancourt, to be drowned out even more so. Generally speaking, issues of racial inequality or simply issues regarding race that have occurred within the school have not been approached in a manner that is respectful nor equitable towards or for those negatively affected by such. As we all know after reading the article in the Gazette, talk of equity by Principal Valancourt is merely a cop out that allows for the avoidance of the difficult conversations that are bound to happen when one is a principal of a school, especially when that school happens to be full of high school students with opinions. To me, one who truly wants to turn or work towards turning the school that they run into an equitable place for all does not just keep talking equity to get students in their camp, but rather keeps talking equity because they truly want its implementation to be seen within the school, followed by actions that align with such. Students, especially those who are underrepresented, should not feel as though their principal does not care about them, their concerns, or their struggles. I do not want my siblings last year of high school to be in an environment where he will feel unsafe, nor do I want that to be the case for even a drop of my other siblings' high school career when he attends Northampton High School in two years. All students deserve a safe learning environment by a principal who truly cares for them, run by a principal who truly cares for them, and who actively strives towards making the school an equitable place as they so claim they want it to be. Principal Valancourt has not only proven that she is incapable of being such a principal, but has also made it clear that she simply does not want to be such a principal. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Peter Turr. Hi, it's Natalie Turr. I'm the mom um, of a lead student in second grade and I'm here to talk about masking. Like others, I was disappointed to see that the survey results presented by John Provost regarding masks were not discussed at the last committee meeting. I find it shocking and disconcerting that the decision-making is being left to some people who are incredibly biased and favor policies which protect their own families and children at the expense of the well-being of ours. I feel that the school committee has overrepresented the needs of those in the community who are immunocompromised and tonight, I hope to appeal to the rest of the committee to please stand up and represent the remaining members of the community who are not immunocompromised, but are impacted by this situation in a myriad of different ways. Committee members, will you please stand up for and advocate for the children who are struggling to read? Will you stand up for those with autism, ADHD, hearing loss, social anxiety, and for those with no disabilities, but who are just having a really hard time Last week's COVID update showed one COVID case in the entire school district. If now is not a good time to remove masks, what is? Shall we wait for there to be minus six COVID cases? What is the threshold for the removal of masks? And what is different about Northampton children than those of the rest of the country? And why is the burden upon them to single-handedly stop the spread and mutation of a disease which doesn't significantly impact them? I do understand that the removal of masks is a scary prospect for families with immunocompromised members. I understand this because I am also in this position. However, now that we understand more about this disease and accept that it is not as temporary as we had hoped, 
it is time that we reprioritize our good intentions and shift our focus to the children who have given up so much for the safety of others. It is no longer their responsibility to keep the adults safe around them. It is our responsibility to keep them safe and to allow them a shot at the regular life they deserve during a time that all the adults and other children in the community are doing the same. It is no longer fair to hold the children of Northampton solely accountable for the safety of the entire community, masking them while allowing all others to be unmasked makes no sense and is unlikely to make a significant impact. We are a city which stands for equity. Let us not stand idly by while our children are held to a completely different standard than we are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just wanna clarify that we were brief, sorry, uh, Dr. Provost? I think I was going to make the clarification you were just going to make. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I just wanted to apologize that we were briefly Zoom bombed. I also want to thank member Serafie Cox, who's very quickly acted. Um, and I, but I just wanted to clarify that the person who was speaking, who was Ronnie Gold, that was not Ronnie Gold screen sharing. We were being Zoom bombed. I'm very, very sorry about that. Um, uh, so I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that and we have changed the settings um, and we will, uh, act quickly again if something happens, but I apologize for that. Um, okay, next is Karen Hidalgo. Okay. My name is Karen Hidalgo and I live at 133 Barrett Street. And I wanted to talk about three things tonight. I have two children um, in JFK and I'm a school counselor and department chair at Northampton High School. The first thing I wanted to talk about is leadership and how we support leaders in our community. Leadership is hard. Leaders are always vulnerable to attacks. When people are upset or things aren't going well, there is a tendency to blame the leader whether or not they had any control over the situation. And also, our leaders are human beings, imperfect people with flaws. They make mistakes. If we are honest with ourselves, we know that we all make mistakes and that sometimes we make the same mistakes over and over again for a while until through some combination of openness, new information and reflection, we learn to do better. Lori Valancourt has a lot of qualities that make her a good leader. She is smart, she's caring, and she's willing to make hard decisions. She became principal and then in rapid succession had to face the death of a former student and a global pandemic. She had to make many difficult decisions very rapidly. She worked many, many hours so much of the time. Ms. Valancourt makes mistakes. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. Every administrator out there has made mistakes. Ms. Valancourt acknowledged and apologized. I've seen a lot of growth in her as a leader this year in particular. She's developing teams, relying on others' thinking in addition to her own, and learning to listen more deeply. She is learning to develop and execute a shared vision. She's been a good principal in a lot of ways. If we support her in the way that we would want to be supported in areas where we struggle, she will be even better. The second issue I want to speak to is masks. I'm not taking a position on how a vote should go tonight. What I do wanna say is that on Friday last week, I heard students asking very good questions. One I wanna highlight um, that they asked is about when there would be criteria for lifting or imposing a mask mandate. That is what I want to know as well. I want you to think about a few things as you are making the decision. One is at the beginning of the pandemic when we were wearing cloth masks, the masks were to protect others more than to protect the wearer. Today, with respirator masks available, the mask can now protect the wearer. And two, there is an environmental impact to medical mask wearing. So while it is necessary, it is justifiable, but when it is no longer necessary, it's irresponsible to require it. Maybe we aren't quite ready to lift the mandate because we can't open the windows or because Europe is seeing a surge. I honestly don't know, but I would like to see our community have clear criteria and guidance around when the mask wearing can shift to optional in our schools. I think we have enough information to do this at this time. And lastly, um, please leave the math curriculum decisions to our fabulous math professional teachers. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay, next is Kevin Mackey. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Kevin Mackey. I'm a resident in Florence. And uh, I just want to echo what Ronnie Gold and Brienne have said. Um, the masks need to come off the kids now. The, the town, the city of Northampton has already pulled the mandate. All the surrounding towns have pulled the mandates. It's hypocritical to have adults walking around unmasked while expecting kids to remain masked. I don't see the logic in that. Um, as others have said, this causes speech problems, developmental problems, even dental problems in growing children. And enough is enough. You know, this is, this is a case of the, the solution is worse than the problem. And these masks are abusing children. Uh, we need to, we need to remove them immediately and we need to make sure they never come back again. Thank you. Thank you. Next is, uh, Sapia Fox, Sapia, Sapia, you tell um, me. Yes, I, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I have lived in the Pioneer Valley for like 30 years. I am a retired um, Massachusetts elementary ed school teacher. I am currently a grandparent and since they started the mask mandate, I have been homeschooling my nine-year-old grandson for two years um, because masking is, um, I don't think appropriate for children. And right now, I would like to urge Northampton, which is a city I dearly love. It's very um, attractive to the arts and a lot of expression of you know things going on. And I, I think that what's happened in the last two years is, you know, from the very beginning, it was known that um, masks did nothing to prevent the spread of the flu virus through studies that were scientifically done. In the last two years, there have been over 150 studies which have adequately showed that masks do nothing to prevent the spread of the COVID virus. It is obviously um, scientifically backed that masks do nothing. However, it seems that we are in the midst of a pandemic of people who refuse to think for themselves and are unable to grasp the scientific concepts. Uh, for some reason, they want to believe the authorities. But I want to go further. I also have a background in health education. I have doctorate degrees and master's degrees in <clears throat> medical degrees. Um, and I have studied this ongoing because of the question of this and because of people refusing to think about it and look at the science. And one of the things that has come out of this, which is amazing, and if I'm presenting this for people who are able to think is that um, a virus has never been isolated, not one single virus, not measles, not HIV, not um, polio. They have never isolated or proven one single virus and they've never proven it causes disease. Now we've proven bacteria, fungi, and parasites. We have proven all of these, vi all of these cause disease. We have done Koch's postulate and shown that they can be contagious and transferred from one person to another. But this has never been done for not one single virus. There have been rewards offered for someone who could isolate the measles virus over 10 years ago, and nobody has been able to do it. And it is time now for us to fully evaluate. I mean, we have this ongoing pandemic, and we need to look at it as something that is opening the doors to real investigation, to real science, to real evaluation, rather than just listening to authorities and abiding by authorities because we're refusing to think for ourselves, thinking that the experts know everything. And we are too ignorant to, to read the studies, to follow the science, to look at the patents, to look at these stories. And that's what I suggest, that this is an opportunity for that's real fair. educators to go. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Sarit's phone. 
Hi. Oops, hold on, you muted again. Hi, um, my name is Sarit Shatkin Stern. Um, I am part of a two healthcare worker family. I've been working in the front lines, essentially in the hospital, um, not on a COVID unit, but inpatient and in the clinic for the entire pandemic, including while I was pregnant. Um, and I have cried copious tears over people not wearing masks and um, like kind of had a mental breakdown about it. Um, and, uh, I've sent people to the ICU who were sick with COVID, um, and experienced a lot of trauma. Um, and I also think that it is time for our kids to stop wearing masks in school. Um, I, the baby I was pregnant with during this pandemic is 20 months old. And he says, um, maybe five fairly unintelligible words. Um, he should be saying at least 50 now, um, be basically wore masks inside and outside and completely isolated ourselves as many uh, people have done. And we thought we were doing a good job. And of course he has experienced some harm from that. Um, he's not yet school age, so this doesn't even really apply to him, but I do have school age children. Um, and I am now aware finally that um, there, you know, the harms of wearing masks may not really be apparent to us while we're wearing them. It may not happen until down the line that we're, we realize that there are problems. Um, I do also have an immunocompromised uh, grandparent. Um, and he's, you know, just having a good time seeing his friends and, you know, small groups. He goes out to eat in restaurants. Um, we do see him. We um, test. We have, we're grateful to have the opportunity to test before we see him. He's vaccinated and will be vaccinated a fourth time. Um, and he doesn't really expect that, um, you know, my school age children are responsible for holding the entire pandemic at bay. Um, so I just um, really want to advocate for the kids to be able to not bear the burden of this. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is John Fry. Good evening, Mayor Shara, Superintendent Provost, committee members. I want to follow up on my comments from last week regarding the operation of the Superintendent's Health Advisory Committee, the SHAC. Last week, I objected that the committee was acting as a subcommittee, subject to open meeting laws. First, a quick background on how the shack was designed to operate. During the pandemic earlier, Superintendent Provost was asked to advise the school committee and recommend COVID policy. Not being a medical expert, he wisely and properly engaged professionals to advise him so he could properly guide the school committee. He would then report back to the committee during open meetings. Starting in January, the new school committee changed the format of this advisory committee and put two of their own members on it. This change created a very real problem. The Shack report now comes from a school committee member with his own agenda and, his, and in his own very subjective words. His so-called notes from the Shack meeting are sent to the entire school committee in advance of the school committee meeting. That is the very definition of an open meeting law violation. School committee members may not communicate out of public view. This is improper deliberation. The school committee members on SHAC must be removed now from the advisory committee, and the public should hear from Dr. Provost directly about what occurred in the SHAC meeting. Going forward, if the school committee members are to remain on SHAC, the, kid, the committee should proper, pro, properly be designated a subcommittee with open hearings and be subject to open meeting law accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Diana Ploss. Diana, can you unmute? There you go. I'm good, I'm good. Thank you so much. Over the past two and a half years, we have felt the strong arm of our government and experienced just how far the government will go in order to control the populace. And we have no one to blame but ourselves. We have allowed this. Kudos to the grandmother who is homeschooling her grandson. And what I wanna to say to more so to the people who have tuned into this, is I am struggling to understand why more people 
have not pulled their children from these communist schools. These are indoctrination centers. That's what they are. And yet, right now, there are people on here pleading with government officials regarding putting masks on their children. Why are you giving these people so much power? I, I, frankly, I, it baffles me. Pull your children out of these schools. It will solve so many problems. Figure out a way, sell one of your cars, quit one of your jobs, downsize, get rid of the iPhones in your, in your, in your house, get rid of cable, figure out a way to save your children from this abuse. What is happening to children in schools and what has happened is abusive, extremely abusive. Please love your children and take them out of these communist schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Randy Baker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. <clears throat> um, none of you on the school committee has any business whatsoever about making decisions about children's health and well-being other than your own. The fact that you were put in charge by the state to make decisions about masking other people's kids is unfortunate and aligns with the gross mismanagement and buck passing this state is so famous for. That being said, you were put in charge to make a decision about children's day-to-day -day lives, and you should have realized immediately that it's not up to you and left it up to the parents. Knowing full well, if people were concerned about the health and well-being of their kids and themselves, they had the option to continue to let the, them wear a mask, keep letting them wear a mask, children, yourselves, whoever. Your behavior might think that the only option on the table here is banning masks completely. It's pathetic. You're all liable for any possible legal action in the future due to the harm caused by this ridiculous mask policy, and you all need to be held accountable. We cannot forget what you've chosen to do to our kids. Mike Stein, you have absolutely no business on being, being part of that school committee. You obviously cannot make an unbiased voter opinion, and the fact that you have a say in anybody's children's day-to-day -day life is beyond scary. You should resign immediately. And why in the world would you people send out the set for the second time public outreach to ask what the parents and caregivers and teachers want and then do the complete opposite? What a, what a complete joke. Every parent, teacher, and caregiver should be insulted. This is beyond insulting. It's atrocious, and it shows that you people have no place on that committee. Elementary school kids in the cafeteria are still not allowed to talk during lunch. Assigned seating, can't talk, can't move. If that shouldn't make you sick, it should. If it doesn't make you sick, it's like a concentration camp down there. And where's all the sick kids in Massachusetts? It's been 24 days without masks in schools. So where's all the sick kids? You people need to make masks optional tonight. It's what the parents want. It's what everybody else wants. Stop abusing our kids. This, this is, this is, this is a joke, and you people are all responsible for it. And everybody talking is being way too nice. Can you please state your I'm name and city or town for the record? Randy Baker. I got a second grade student at Bridge Street School, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sarah Madison Buell. Hi, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm Sarah Madison Buell. Um, I'm a student at the high school and at the middle school as well. Uh, I have a statement um, to make with regard to the recent events surrounding Northampton High School. I urge all the stakeholders involved to view the issues at hand as separately as possible. Uh, hope we can take a long view on our shared goal, which I still believe is student growth. In my mind, there are two issues. I don't know whether embedded honors um, 
embedded honors math is a proven winner. I have children on both ends of that argument. And um, I think our, our most skilled teachers will tell us what works and what doesn't and what they'd like to try. We're a community of thinkers and maybe there's room to pilot a program or two uh, and to see what might be the right fit. I trust the teachers. Um, I also know that people say irresponsible things in anger. I know that teenagers level disparaging remarks and frustration and adults do it too. However, I expect a prominent school leader to do better. If they fully understand the purpose of their calling, they would not see the students as obstacles, but as partners. If a single misguided electronic communication were the only issue at hand, the students would disregard it. Their feelings, their thoughts and actions point to something bigger. And I propose that the bigger issue underlying the weaponization of equity is a school climate that has succumbed to mistrust and a wrongheaded approach to leadership. The real inquiry should not be about one incident, but many, and it should happen quickly. We need to stop talking about name calling and start talking about whether or not the school is headed in the direction we hoped with inspirational leaders using teachable moments to guide the next generation of leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Zara Usman. Ha, hello, my name is Zara Usman. I am an eighth grade student at JFK Middle School. At the school committee meeting last week, there was discussion around implementing a place in school students could take their masks off. I would like to say, at least in my school, JFK, we are very tight on space. Making the school set up yet another space is unfair, especially during the middle of the year. I hope you take this into consideration. I would also like to reiterate what I said at last week's meeting, which was to urge you to keep the mask mandate in place. Masks keep everyone safe. One of the people I live with is my grandmother, who is an at-risk community member. I do not want to put her in more risk simply by attending school, a place I love. Not to mention the amount of change that we have gone through as students this year, from the different flex systems, lunch situations, etc. A regular routine is still needed. Please don't change our routine around masks. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mark Newey. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Newey. I am a Northampton resident and a parent. Um, and uh, I'm speaking tonight to urge the committee to lift the school mask mandate. Uh, I feel like it is time now to let parents make the decision for their children uh, as to what level of risk they're willing and feel is appropriate. Children are the least at risk of severe impacts of COVID-19, and yet the most restrictions have been placed on them. Uh, it really makes very little sense uh, to be masking our children who we know uh, young children in particular uh, have difficulty with social and emotional development when they can't see others' faces. And young children in particular uh, are just learning uh, what it means to talk when they eat at lunch with a friend. They're learning what it means to um, have a positive experience at school. Uh, to see smiles at school, which you know, young children may not have seen any smiles yet in their whole school career because of the mask mandate. And uh, the current policy that we have in the Northampton schools is out of line with uh, state and federal guidelines. Uh, we are a low risk county from the uh, CDC's map, uh, masking is not recommended as a uh, requirement. Um, and again, to allow all others throughout the city to go without masks and to be able to make their own decisions 
but to place that burden of mask wearing and trying to stop the, the pandemic on the children who really need to, uh, to be free of masks um, is unfair and I think inappropriate. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Dolores McGee. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for being on the call. I found a lot of the um, per, uh, people's um, contributions to this conversation very insightful. So thank you to everyone. Um, can I ask I you to state your name and city or town? Um, I'd rather not, thank you. Um, um, I would just wanna express my feelings about masking on the children as well. And I am very much against it. Um, masks have not been proven to work in stopping the spread of COVID-19. And in fact, there's a lot of data to indicate that they've actually had a very negative impact on children's academic learning, um, their physical health, their mental well-being, <clears throat> and on and on. So I think the um, negative impacts far outweigh any kind of positive impact that they may have had, which they, they have not. Um, so I just want the board to um, consider our existence as social beings who rely on connectedness, which is just an intangible element of humanity that we all depend on for well-being. Masks perpetuate fear and fear weakens our immune system. So if we still are to be battling COVID-19, let us do so in ways that elevates our entire system of health, i.e. ways that in include vitamin D, laughter, healthy nutrition, and exercise, to name a few, and not in ways that downgrade our existence to divided and fearful individuals who walk widely and skeptically around one another. Um, I think we just, there's a lot of, there's a lot missing when we don't connect with each other as humans. The kids are really suffering for this. There's been skyrocketing cases of mental illness, depression, suicide, untold amounts of academic loss. And there's just nothing that we can, uh, there's not a case to be made to mask the children. I don't even actually think it's legal. I think that um, it's masks are a medical device and to mandate something like that is not legal. So I ask the board to consider all of that as you make your decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is John Galvin. Hi there, it's John Galvin and I am in Northampton. I have three children in the schools here, two at the high school and one at JFK. I'm not gonna belabor the point. I think you've heard widely from the community that it is time for the mask to be optional fall in line with the state court system, which recently made mass optional. I do wanna fact check one quick point that Joe Pater raised when he said that according to the CDC research, Hampshire County is in a high zone, absolutely not true. I would encourage the school committee to Google CDC COVID-19 by county and you will see that Hampshire County is in green. And fact check, one other point. Yes, it's true. Concord shut down a school for one day, Friday. And on Monday, it was back to normal. Thank you for all the eloquent speakers who went before. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Miss Churchill Windsor. Hi, sorry, I, I'm a teacher in Northampton, so I have Miss Churchill Windsor on my thing, but my name is Sarah Churchill Windsor. I'm a sixth grade special education teacher at JFK Middle School, and I live in South Deerfield, Massachusetts. I stand in solidarity with the first grade teachers and ESPs who deserve to be able to serve their vulnerable young students. I stand in solidarity with the parents of both first and sixth grade teachers who only want the best education for their children. 
Thank you to the mayor, superintendent, and the school committee for giving me a moment to speak about the proposal to change the sixth grade from three teams to two teams at JFK, which eliminates one sixth grade teaching position. I have worked in Northampton Public Schools for 14 years, and I'm not only the longest tenured sixth grade teacher at JFK, but I'm also the longest serving special education teacher in the building. I am a mentor teacher, and I am the professional rights and responsibility chair for our local teachers union. Last night, myself and two of my colleagues representing all three sixth grade academic teams had the pleasure of meeting with the curriculum subcommittee where we were able to articulate our concerns around this proposed change. I appreciate the time that we were given to inform the subcommittee. My hope and my ask is that due to the fact that this meeting only occurred last night and the decision to change the sixth grade format from three to two teams is on the agenda tonight. We ask that this decision be delayed un until at least the next school committee meeting so that the curriculum subcommittee will have time to share their thoughts, concerns, pros and cons with the larger school committee so that an informed decision can be made regarding this proposal. We would like for Desmond Caldwell to have the opportunity to speak with the subcommittee as well so that that group can get a full picture of what is being recommended for our school. I wanna shout out to Principal Caldwell for being willing to discuss this when the sixth grade teachers um, found that this was happening or the proposal was happening, of course. We would like for the school committee to consider alternatives to eliminating a teacher position. We asked the school committee to go to the city and ask for our schools to be properly funded so that our children get the education that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Georgia. Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. So um, I would like to bring a little bit of a different perspective, but I am uh, backing up Saf uh, Safaya Fox completely 100%. Can you please state your name and city or town for the record? Uh, I'd rather not. I'm so sorry, my name is so so with the, so the Massachusetts Association of School Committees has a, a law, a rule that says general rules for committees, public comment period, any citizen wishing to speak before the committee shall identify themselves by name and address. Uh, we've okay. been- so, 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 uh, so I will then, uh, Georgia O'Donnell from Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I would like to uh, bring up a few things and I would like to support Sophia Fox uh, completely and absolutely in what she stated. I am, um, I am quite, um, I'm quite surprised by how people have been dealing with this last two years in America. Obviously, as you can hear from my accent, I, I was raised in a different country and I am Scandinavian by origin. There are eight countries in Scandinavia that I doubt you name, but there are eight countries in Scandinavia. In these countries, uh, children 18 years and younger never once put on a mask. Never once did they put, a, put on a mask. We're talking about millions of young children. And if you think about it also, the children in Africa never put on a mask. Just think about it. Now, my background is currently in counseling in uh, Greece. And my prior background was in uh, mass media and uh, propaganda. And um, I know how to read through the propaganda. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm amazed by most Americans not being able to read through the propaganda that is taking place. I'm also astonished by the fact that in America, people have not been emphasizing health and nutrition. If you look at the young people in America, the children in the school system, they know nothing about organic food. They know nothing about uh, exercising. They eat whatever is brought to them uh, to the table. Most of the food in the stores in America today is crap, and you know that. And in the last two years, I'm astonished that the, the emphasis has not been on health and nutrition. Now, what I would like to talk about today, because I work in grief counseling, I have a private practice. I have in the last two years seen an uptick in suicide of young people. And I've also seen an uptick in um, 
the overdoses of young people. The youngest person that I know has that committed suicide was 16 years old. The next, the second youngest was 17 years old. A young boy, he left a suicide note for his parents to read when they would wake up in the morning and they were trying to wake him up. There was a suicide note on his laptop. And this is what the parents had to deal with having to find their own son because he could not take the pressure anymore of the isolation and the mask wearing. Another teenager also in Massachusetts had the same issue. He could not deal with it. He killed himself. This is just not okay in America anymore. You have to remove the mask and this masking the children in America is dumbing down the American children. As a child, as a, as a, as a child, I had a speech, in, I, I, I just one sentence, as a child, I had a speech impediment and I could not survive what you guys are doing to the children today. I would not be able to communicate with anyone today. Today I'm a polygot, but I had never, I had never wore a mask. Thank you. Next is Patrick Bowen. Good evening, committee members. I'm Patrick Bowen. I live at Nine Hayward Street here in Northampton. My son goes to Leeds. I um, want to start out by noting uh, there was a comment earlier by Joe Pater in which he used the phrase the CDC metrics on the city's website, which was our long way of saying the old CDC metrics that we don't use anymore. So if you're using the wrong metrics from pre-vaccine COVID, then we are high risk. But if you use the accurate metrics the CDC is actually using today, we're a low risk. We should probably update the city website to use the correct numbers. Um, with respect, I'd like the school committee to correct this error from last week and rem remove masks starting today. Um, a note that this Dr. Prover said that the community survey got the most stunning response he's ever received, and the majority of opinion was in favor of ending the mask mandate, and this got zero discussion from the committee. And I'm not sure why you sent out a survey or be a public body if you don't talk about the survey results from your community. I want to speak to uh, the point that John Frey made, made earlier regarding open meeting law. I was on the Nor Northampton's housing partnership for nearly five years. And as you're supposed to when you're on a city committee and became well versed in open meeting law. I also created and ran a subcommittee as part of my time on the housing partnership. Once the school committee added its own members to the shack, that became a subcommittee of the school committee that's subject to open meeting law. So therefore the school committee is currently in violation of open meeting law until it removes those members from the shack. So now those two members are deliberating on matters with, which will come to the school committee later for a vote. And reporting back, it seems like by email, which is another open meeting violation about those deliberations. And that's the little definition of not deliberating publicly, which is the whole point of open meeting law. So given that you're either unaware or purposely violating this basic state governance law, why should we trust you to make good decisions on school masking since you're now ignoring the CDC, Massachusetts DPH, and now with the survey, your own community. Um, additionally, additionally, given that education of children is considered a right, that means there's no enforcement mechanism for masking. The schools cannot kick students out of school for not wearing a mask. If you do so, you're violating a student's right to education and risking a lawsuit. So having a policy that has no enforcement mechanism is not a good idea. School committee should repeal its face mask policy in full tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Ari uh, Dabaloy. Um, good evening, school committee. My name is Ari Dabi Valois. I'm a sophomore at uh, NHS and I uh, live in Florence. I first, um, and I'm in support of dropping the school mask mandate. I first wanna say I disagree with the conspiracy theorists who come on the Zoom saying that masks don't work. That is false. Masks do work and they were very useful for us earlier in the pandemic. They were necessary to keep the schools open and I'm happy we use them. But we've come to a time when they are actually unnecessary, according to the CDC. I respect Meredith O'Leary and the rest of the SHAC committee. I'm sure they are awesome experts in their fields, but I do have a problem that we are putting the decision to keep masks to this small group of people 
when the CDC, the huge governing body for controlling illness, says that we do not need to require masks. I think we need to be brave and we need to lift the mandate, but we also need to respect any student who would wish to keep on wearing their mask. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dahlia Breslow. Uh, so Dahlia, you're not gonna be able to turn on your video. We were being Zoom bombed again, so I had to take off that option. I apologize. I wish Zoom uh, created an option that I could just allow you do it to do it, but they don't. So I'm sorry about that, Dahlia. No problem at all. Um, hi, my name is Dahlia Breslow and I live in Ward 2 of Northampton. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm a junior at Northampton High School, a member of the Student Union, and the co-chair of the Northampton Youth Commission. I was also part of the subgroup of the Student Union that reached out to school administrators to talk about embedded honors. But tonight I speak to you as an individual. I'd like to address the chat messages sent by Principal Valancourt that were released in the report compiled by former school committee member Susan Voss. Although most people have responded with uproar over the asshat comment, the significance of the report to me is it reveals how the high school's administrative leaders assign little value to the act of listening and healthy discourse. Everyone in this district deserves the chance to speak up for changes they wish to see as exemplified by public comment right now. The student union, whose job it is to speak on behalf of the student body, is lucky to have direct access to communication with school administration, which we use often. All we ask in return is that administration earnestly listens and takes our comments into consideration. Unfortunately, this does not always happen. The instance revealed in the report is only one of part of a pattern in which student voices have been disregarded and disrespected. While serving on the student union, I notice each time that Principal Valancourt dismisses concerns that we bring to her. In these instances, we are not on the offensive. We have genuine questions, genuine concerns that we hope to resolve through healthy conversation. I am proud to live in a city that is opinionated. Let us foster a school community that teaches kids to share these characteristics, not discourage them. Let us remember that school administration is tasked with not only creating a learning environment for academics, but teaching students how to advocate for themselves and encourage clear communication. In closing, if you could have one takeaway, it would be that I believe that students should be encouraged by administration to reach out and more importantly, be greeted with open ears. I hope you believe this too. Thank you. Thank you, Dahlia. Okay, next up is, hold on, I'm just trying to see if there's any way I can, sorry, I'm trying to see if there's any option for allowing individual people to turn on their videos, but there just really isn't. Um, next is Atticus uh, Haskins Rogers. Hello, actually, my name is uh, Otis. Rogers Atticus is my son. He goes to Leeds Elementary School. Uh, we live in Florence, uh, Massachusetts, and I just want to speak in favor of our keeping the mask mandate in place a little longer. I have two uh, things I'd like to add to the discussion. Many things have already been said, but first of all, I just want to say that uh, the mask mandate has been lifted almost everywhere in our lives now, and we can choose not to go to the grocery store, we can choose not to go to the convenience store, we can choose not to go to a party with our friends, but we cannot choose to leave our kid home. There is no virtual option uh, in Northampton. We have to send our son to school and we are a high risk household. So I'm asking for your, um, your understanding with that. Um, so please, let's try to keep the mask made it a little longer. The other thing I'd like to add is that um, I just want to correct that a lot of people have said that all the districts around here have dropped their mask mandates. Uh, that is not true. I work in Springfield Public Schools, and we still have masks in place, uh, and we we will for the foreseeable future, as far as I've, as a, far as I've heard, and um, and we're doing just fine. We have exceptions for certain students that need help. 
Uh, some students are allowed to have their masks off sometimes um, for certain occasions, and uh, that seems to be helpful. It seems to be a reasonable accommodation. So I think that's all I just want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Marissa Mendoza. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Marissa Mendoza. I'm a Northampton community member and parent, and I'm here to express my concerns regarding the term equity and its reference the past few weeks. I wish to speak to actions the committee can take to address these concerns. I appreciate what Ms. Buell mentioned here this evening, and I implore the school committee to consider conducting a full equity audit of the district. This audit will move the district beyond the anti-racism statements it tends to put out in response to acts of racism and bias and move towards becoming anti-racist. This audit would allow an outside consultant to conduct a detailed assessment of equity with regards to curriculum, discipline, the student, caregiver, and staff experience. It would identify strengths and areas for growth. This audit would also allow the district to develop a comprehensive anti-racism strategic plan that would support all stakeholders and move our district towards becoming a space where all students and staff have brave and supported spaces, where we can call out white supremacy culture and identify the actions we must take to dismantle it. You cannot have true equity if your approaches are not anti-racist. As you consider the FY23 budget tonight, I encourage you to identify money for this audit. It is one of the first steps you can take towards repairing harm and improving our district. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Oliver. Oh, hello. My name is Trinidad. I am Oliver's mother. He goes to Leeds and we live also in Leeds. Um, well, uh, my son would like to share with all of you a survey that he did. He's in fourth grade in Leeds elementary and he did himself um, this survey about the mask. I just want to say that I also have another child who also attends uh, Leeds. He is not even four yet and he does have some speech problems because of wearing face mask. Um, and I want to say that I wish we could um, just, you know, let the mask be optional for whoever feels like they really need to wear it and let the parents take responsibility for that. Um, well, he is my son. He would like to join, to share about his survey. He's Oliver and he's in fourth grade. Um, I did a survey during lunch out of all of fifth grade, 50 kids fourth said they wanted masks up, fourth grade, 50 kids said they wanted masks optional and none of them said they wanted to keep masks. Tell them, tell them what you think is important for yourself. So we should take off masks. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Sorry you couldn't turn your camera on. I know. Next is Lucy Bernhard. Hello, my name is Lucy Bernhard. I am a senior at Northampton High School. I would just like to thank the school committee, um, the mayor, Dr. Provost, for this opportunity to speak and voice my opinion, as well as allowing my Northampton, my fellow Northampton residents to speak as well. Um, I am one of the co-organizers of the walkout at the North at Northampton High School last week regarding Principal Valancourt. Um, I would like to start just by saying that I feel so grateful and privileged that I was able to grow up in Northampton and attend Northampton public schools. Um, at these schools, I was taught and learned how to be a caring and compassionate human being to um, think about other people's positions, what they may be going through, to have empathy for them. And so that is part of the reason why I um, wanted to organize the walkout last week in response to Valancourt's um, comment about the student union at the Northampton High School. However, that was not really the main focus of the walkout or the main focus that I had um, when I 
was planning this walkout, um, Principal Valancourt wrote in the student handbook, I'm going to paraphrase a bit, that she is dedicating her position and herself to creating um, a welcoming environment and a culture of calling people in rather than calling others out when talking about other issues or concerns that the students have or that the faculty have at the school. And that is something that I have not experienced in the three years that Principal Valancourt has been principal, which is another reason why I was so inclined to um, organize the demonstration last week. And I really implore all of the members of the school committee to um, continue to talk about this, to talk about what we want in our educators, in our school administrators, because I just do not believe that this is what Northampton High School should represent. I think that there is so much potential for Northampton High School and for um, the students at Northampton High School. And although I am a senior this year, I have a younger sibling who is a sophomore and I feel very passionate and very strongly that um, the students, even after I am long gone, deserve better and that they deserve someone who they can trust, who creates a welcoming and safe environment. And I hope that that is something that can be continued to be talked about and discussed with the student community as well. Thank you, Lucy. Next is Pauline. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, so my name is Pauline. I live in West Springfield. I have a student at Northampton High School. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, we're a fully vaccinated family, which I'm sure would shock some people, um, but we know that some people are not or cannot be. And we know it's not all about just mortality rates. Um, we're not really interested in long COVID either or giving it to someone else for whom mortality rate would be a bigger factor. Um, so contrary to the comment that the people who are promoting continued mask mandates are doing so for their own benefit and protection, I wanna point out that my family and our friend groups are doing it for others. Um, we're doing it for children whose parents won't let them be vaccinated. Um, we're doing it for the immunocompromised and so on. So I just wanted to clarify that part. Um, as someone else said, students are legally required to be in school. Um, not every family can homeschool, nor does every family want to. Um, personally, I've been there, done that, it was great. Um, but now public school is providing a lot of benefits and a great environment for my high schooler. Uh, they love it there, uh, even with the masks. Um, I know that there are folks who feel like there can be no intermixing of, let's say, individualistic and collectivistic approaches, but there can be. Um, you know, we can make our own individual decisions to lift mitigation steps in our homes or out in our friend groups or in the community while continuing to uh, care for our neighbors when we are forced to be together, as is the case in school. Um, being in school is not the same as people having a choice whether to go into a store or out to the parks, which someone said before I could, so thank you. Uh, nuance is important when making comparisons and coming to conclusions. Um, not all of the conclusions mentioned in this meeting would stand up to scientific scrutiny. Um, so folks are concerned about lack of communication and seeing faces, absolutely a valid concern, um, might be addressed in various ways that don't involve unmasking in the classroom. I know the weather's getting warmer, students can be outside, students can see each other outside of school, students probably have family members, et cetera. And out in the community, they're not gonna be around masked people anymore. Um, other kids, um, others speak of kids being upset by masks. I have to say anecdotally, the families where parents aren't often driving home the idea that masks are an infringement or an abuse, I've seen that all of the kids I know have been really willing to mask up. I think um, what folks are being told has something to do with it. Uh, there's a lot of talk about science. Uh, there's talk about professionals. Uh, one thing was don't trust them coming from someone who listed their credentials in their intro. 
Um, but it's wise to remember that science also doesn't advise changing multiple variables at once, points out the issues with research method methods, such as the limitations and the choices in the community poll um, and the results that some people are coming to regarding it. Um, thankfully, somebody else pointed out all time. Yes. All right. You well, can finish your sentence. Oh, I was just <laughs> I think um, we should go ahead and continue it. Uh, we don't want to seesaw. We've seen that happen. Uh, you know, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you give it a little time? We've got people we can look at and see what's happening with it. Thank you. Thanks. Next is Adrian Staub. Hi, uh, my name is Adrian Staub. I live in Leeds. I have uh, children at the high school and at Leeds Elementary. Um, so you've heard from a lot of people on, the, um, in, on all sides of this issue. Um, and as, as we come to the end, I guess, I, I'd like you to consider another perspective, which is that, I mean, I think that in, in the eyes of many people in our community, the school committee runs the risk of really undermining its legitimacy as a, as a body by continuing the mask mandate. So... Um, the federal authorities are not recommending, federal public health authorities are not at this point recommending mask mandates for children in the situation of children in our community. The state authorities are not recommending it. And the city board of health has removed the indoor mask mandate for the city as a whole. And yet in school committee members in our, in our city who were certainly not elected with this issue in mind, are in the position of potentially maintaining a mandate that our children in schools wear masks on their faces. Um, for many Northamptonites, this issue is so out of, the, out of the purview of the school committee, or should be so out of the purview of the school committee, given the unanimity of the public health authorities on this issue, that your continued masking of our schools really does undermine your legitimacy, your authority. And I would ask the members of the school committee to reflect on the kinds of issues that they expected to be weighing when they were elected, when they ran for school committee, the kinds of issues that their voters expected them to be weighing in on. And I think that reflection will lead them to the conclusion that um, these certainly, these issues certainly did not include these making independent decisions, decisions independent of the public health authorities um, about our children's, about our children's health and about the, the, the possibility <laughs> specifically that they should have their faces masked in school. Um, so I, I really think this body is, is, is in a, in a, in a funny position right now where you are taking for yourselves a kind of authority that certainly no one intended when they elected you. Um, and I ask you to consider that as you consider this vote. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you. Next is Liz Burnworth. Hi, my name is Liz Burnworth and I'm a resident of Leeds and I have a fifth grader. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity tonight to talk with you about the proposed budget which includes a proposal to cut sixth grade teams at JFK from three to two teams. Um, I believe that this would be a serious mistake and I implore you to maintain three teams at JFK. Um, the current fifth graders have been through so much in their education from wins to the pandemic. They've not had a typical school year since second grade. If the shift from two team, if the sh shift for to two teams and much larger class sizes occurred, as this group enters sixth grade, it would be happening at a time when there's need for more teachers and smaller classes. The move to sixth grade is a time of huge transitions, academically, socially, and emotionally. Youth need smaller classes and more adults in their lives, not the opposite. The incoming sixth grader class has approximately 60 students on IEPs. I'm told that the need is even greater in classes that follow this group which are also children who proportionately had more disrupted years of education. Um, in some of the meetings I've attended about the budget, I've heard that um, students with IEP services such as math and reading 
would receive pullout services, I worry for those students when they're back in the general ed classroom, um, when their services are being provided in an inclusion model, such as in writing, um, that they wouldn't receive the attention that they need, the differentiated attention that they need. Um, and so I really worry that those students will get lost in larger classes. And I really hope that we can give them the opportunity to adjust to middle school with three teams before making the move to two teams in seventh grade. I'm also worried about teacher preparation for this proposed change and teacher retention. As I learned during public comment two meetings ago from a letter read by the sixth grade teacher and through conversations with educators, teachers, both general education and special education are opposed to this change. I'm worried that after the stresses of the past two years, additional changes without proper supports will result in more educators leaving the district. I'm also concerned about families leaving Northampton Public Schools for other schools as they seek smaller class sizes. This would be detrimental to the overall school budget. As we know, once a budget line is removed, it is virtually impossible to re-implement it. Knowing that classes following this current fifth grade have even more needs than the current high needs of the rising sixth graders, to reduce the teams would be a huge mistake. In conclusion, I urge you to find other ways in the budget to achieve cost savings. Do not reduce JFK sixth grade to two teams at the expense of our children's education. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is uh, Gina Carmi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I just, um, thanks for uh, listening to all our voices. Can you and, see your name in city or town? Oh, sure. I'm Gina Carmi. I'm from Springfield. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for listening to all our voices. Um, I just want to reiterate what some folks have said about it being time to lift the masks. Um, I think there's been a lot of conversation about equity and things being equitable. And I just ask, where is the equity for those students who um, are being harmed by the masks or that don't wanna wear the masks? I think those, that needs to be considered. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Melissa Matson. Melissa, can you unmute? Next we have thank you all um, to the members of the school committee. I thank you for the work you have been doing. It is not an easy task. I'm speaking to you this evening as a parent, a professor, and a pharmacist. I urge you to follow medical experts and the decision to make masks optional. Please, please, please listen to our physicians, pediatricians, DESI, the CDC, our children and caregivers. Making masks optional allows the choice for individuals. School districts and masks that lifted the mask mandating huge outbreak. This virus is here to stay. How you deal with it now is a personal choice for people. We are in a much different place than March, 2020. We have vaccines with 94% efficacy, free testing, and finally, pharmacotherapy treatment options if someone were to become moderately to severely ill. I do not believe our director of public health has a medical degree nor background. Listening to one person's opinion is frightening. It would be a slippery slope should litigation occur and our decision makers did not follow evidence-based medicine and best practices put forth by DESI, the CDC and content experts. My children have missed two years of normal school life and activities. The stress and untold effects will last years who will take responsibility in the years to come? Please listen to the facts and not opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I see no further comment. So we will start uh, the rest of our agenda. Thank you everyone who participated in public comment. Um, and we will move on to announcements. I am looking for school committee members. Any announcements?
Um, oh, hold on. Let me, I'm trying to get you all on one screen. Okay, I don't see any hands. So I'm going to assume there are no announcements. Uh, Dr. Provost? I'm just noticing that um, someone named Sanger Green has hand up. I don't know if they were trying to get into the public comment period. Um, uh, hold on, let me find them. Hi, Sanger Breen, um, were you trying to make a comment? We just ended public comment, but I'll allow your comment if you wanna comment right now, and then I'm gonna move on to the rest of the agenda. Do you have a comment to make? Hi, yes, thank you. I just wanted to make a brief comment. Um, my name is Sanger Breen and I'm currently a senior at Northampton High School. Um, and thank you, Dr. Provost and the school committee for listening um, and giving me a chance to voice my opinions. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly on the subject of Principal Valancourt. Um, many individuals have eloquently spoken and expressed their feelings and opinions surrounding um, Principal Valancourt. I wanted Sanger. to elaborate on a few more aspects of the current situation. Yes? Uh, we stopped being able to hear you for a moment, but now you seem to be back. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where I cut out, but um, I just wanted to elaborate on a few more aspects of the principal Valancourt situation. Um, I wanted to first preface my perspective on it by saying that I don't agree or assent with cancel culture. I think it's an incredibly harmful practice and it diminishes the value in progress, growth, and betterment as a whole. Um, but I think many of the people who are sympathizing with principal Valancourt um, are viewing individuals' frustration and outrage with her um, as an act in accordance with cancel culture. And I think that's incorrect. Um, the peaceful demonstration in response to her actions, um, I think it should be noted that that is an accumulation of many things over the past three years, and it's more about Principal Valancourt's blatant disregard to students' perspective and opinion, um, and I think that people should be aware that it is because she is non-responsive and she's not really making an effort to try to improve and that is more where students' frustration is coming from. And I think that should be noted that it's not on one, it's not on one single singular occurrence. Um, it's the culmination of many things and her unwillingness to listen and work with the student body, um, which is the whole focus and center of her job. So that is where a lot of the frustration is coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um... All right, so back to school committee. No announcements, correct? Okay. Um, so we will move on to new business. And first up, we have um, discussion and possible vote to amend or repeal policy EBCFA, which is face masks and face coverings. And Dr. Provost, you, um, your name is Nexus. Were you going to lead this off? I was actually going to pass this one to Member Goldman, if that's okay. Absolutely, Member Goldman. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for your engagement through public comment and also for the committee to um, continue engaging with this issue. Like many of the issues that the committee deals with, they aren't sort of one and done. They continue to evolve and require us to um, navigate them. This is no exception. Perhaps it is the golden standard at this point. Okay. Um, so uh, we had the last shack meeting we um, yesterday, and we went back, um, Superintendent Provost and the school committee reps on shack asked Meredith O'Leary to provide some more uh, metrics and details on what it would mean for us to um, make, to adjust the policy to be mask optional instead of uh, the mask mandate. And um, she talked, we talked first about some of the numbers where there is an uptick in numbers. Um, we were able to look at how some of those numbers are impacted by the local higher ed community, UMass and Smith and whatnot, um, and confirmed that at this time, we are at a low risk community transmission. Um, so um, after sort of going through the numbers, 
we asked for uh, Director O'Leary to put together a statement and some recommendations and guidelines to present to the committee, being very clear that this decision was for the committee to make. And um, at this time, I think it's appropriate for me to read um, Member O'Leary's letter before making a motion. Um, just as an outline, the first part talks about the goals of the recommendations, and then it goes through four um, components of the recommendation, masking, disease investigation and contact tracing, ventilation, and vaccination. Okay, so here we go. It's uh, two pages. Should the school committee move to remove the existing universal masking policy and transition into optional masking, the Northampton Health Department supports that decision if the following mitigation measures to curb in-school transmission and respond to suspected or confirmed outbreaks in the schools are adopted. The goals of the following recommendations are the following. Prevent in-school transmission of COVID to protect students and school employees, as well as their household family members. Reduce preventable absences due to COVID and expect that COVID mitigation strategies will provide similar benefits regarding other respiratory viruses, influenza, RSV, um, paraflu, Coxsackie virus, et cetera, that cause seasonal absences. Prevent shaming around positive COVID tests. Where, uh, promote social norm that different children and families will make different choices about masking week to week or even day to day and create the expectation and policy that when a group is asked to mask based on a determined risk that everyone will do so to protect the school community. And the fourth goal, continue to mitigate COVID risks for children and families through multi-layered approach. And so these are sort of the multi-layered approach. Um, masking, Massachusetts Department of Public Health requirements. Masks are required Regardless of vaccination status, individuals who meet the criteria to leave strict isolation after five days must continue to wear a securely fitting mask at all times on day six through 10 of the infection, uh, infectious isolation period. Regardless of vaccination status, individuals who are exposed to COVID-19 must wear a mask for 10 days following the exposure. Individuals who are unvaccinated must quarantine at home for at least 10 days following exposure. Individuals who are unable to wear a mask must quarantine at home for the full day, 10 days, regardless of vaccination status. The Northampton Health Department recommendations. Masks are recommended for individuals who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, individuals who are immunocompromised or have other conditions placing them at increased risk for severe illness, and individuals who live with those who are at increased risk for severe illness. Um, Recommended classroom policies after exposure include notification of classroom families and staff, recommendation to monitor for symptoms and test five days after exposure, required policy that classroom students wear masks for five days after exposure. School staff will monitor the classroom for students or staff presenting with symptoms within the next 10 days, students or staff reporting positive tests within the next 10 days. Depending on circumstances of subsequent cases, in-depth contact tracing and quarantine requirements could be necessitated. Recommended thresholds for universal mask requirements in schools. CDC community level in Hampshire County elevates to high for two or more weeks. SHAC determines based on assessment of evidence of increased in-school COVID transmission that there's an increased risk of disease. So that's the masking. Um, approach, mitigation approach. Next is disease investigation and contact tracing. Continue with current levels of contact tracing in order to be able to quickly identify clusters. Positive COVID cases among staff and students reported to school nursing, classrooms, and extracurricular groups of students and staff who are in school while infections, while infectious are monitored for emergency of new cases within the 10 day incubation period, have ability to quickly mobilize supportive contact tracing efforts if it were deemed necessary. Evidence of transmission within a classroom or other school based setting, such as athletic groups, extracurricular, etc. The third strategy um, 
The recommendations for ventilation include improved air quality, air turnover, ventilation, decreases rate of transmission of COVID and other respiratory viruses. Have uniform best practice policies for air circulation and ventilation for the following, HVAC, HEPA filters, natural ventilation with windows, and continue to advocate for improvements in funding for ventilation. And the fourth and last uh, mitigation um, approach is vaccination. Vaccine hes hesitancy exists in our community. There's room for improvement of vaccination rates in each of our school communities. Getting vaccinated against COVID-19 can lower your risk of getting and spreading the virus that causes COVID-19 and helps to build a wall of protection around the children and immunocompromised people they know and love. Support Northampton Health Department efforts to continue to hold vaccination clinics at the schools. Okay, thank you. So this is, um, this is the response from Director O'Leary um, after a conversation in SHAC regarding what the recommendations would be for us to move towards um, a mask, mask optional policy if we, um, as we asked for from after our last meeting. Um, other sort of points um, would be that we still stand behind the previous position of the document that was issued uh, last week, um, but as we were saying before, you know, there was a question requesting um, particular mandates, and it's still the case that, like, the information we had from one week to the next made it possible for the recommendation to shift as the numbers seem stable. Some of the pieces that were of greater concern before um, seemed less of a threat at this point um, because of data on the new variants and um, other metrics. Um, other pieces we talked about was that in schools, um, students are required to attend school, whereas community members are not required to engage in activities where they might be at risk, such as going to restaurants or other places in the city. Um, and um, let's see, Smith Voke has removed their mask mandate after the city lifted it, um, and they've had zero cases, but they, uh, we don't have enough data actually to compare numbers to our population in our high school at this time, um, but hopefully that will be available in coming, coming weeks. Uh, masks, would still be required on buses and in health offices. Um, and I think I could stop there. The last thing I wanna do is just thank everyone again in the community for responding to the mask survey um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to get into how I interpret <laughs> the results, but it is incredibly helpful for me to have that information. And I really appreciate people um, filling it out, and it does have an impact on the way that I, you know, choose how to vote on these issues or or talk about them. So it is valuable, um, and I'm I'm sorry if it if it isn't feeling that way for some of you. John, I just wanted to offer a slight correction to something you said about masks being required on buses. That was a federal rule, but that rule was lifted as of February 25th. There is still a requirement that masks be worn in health offices, but there is no requirement for buses at this time. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else, please, uh, to correct or add? No, nothing else. Um, Member Goldman, uh, were you going to make a motion? Did you say that before? Yeah. Yes. So um, I would like to make a motion to. Um, I'm not sure if it's an amendment or, uh, I would like a motion, make a motion to amend policy EBCFA fat face masks and face coverings um, to align with the guidance and recommendations presented in the document I just read. 
um, from the director, uh, from director O'Leary. Um, thank you. So, so the motion is to amend policy EBCFA to include the recommendations. Um, right, and so I'm, I'm hoping there'll be sort of a healthy discussion and we can really outline what those pieces are. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so motion's been made, seconded by Member Levy. And Member Levy, you have your hand up? I do, but I think two people have their hands up before me. I'm happy oh. to go now, but I can also- I only see, um, oh, I, sorry, I didn't see- um, The superintendent and I see Member Stein. Yes, I can't. I can't see people who don't have their videos on, so. Sorry, I just left mine up. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, Member Stein. Can you I, unmute? Um, I just had one um, clarification um, on the SHAC update. Um, and it could be the case that more things were discussed um, after I left. I know it, it, it went over and I had to leave after the first hour. But um, the only difference between last week and this week um, that Director O'Leary pointed to, to explain the seeming contradiction and the shift of uh, recommendation was that she was concerned about ventilation the prior week. But the concern about ventilation the prior week um, was addressed in that prior meeting. And Dr. Provost sent out an email about it and the statement we received after it. So I, I don't recall uh, when I was there and asking her this question, anything regarding metrics or anything else, the only change week to week was an increase in cases in Northampton. Um, um, and when I was there, I don't know if the, we didn't talk about a metric that's being proposed to be part of the policy of that CDC new high level, which is 200 cases per 100,000. It might have been discussed after I left, um, but that that was not something that we talked about or had input on. Um, so that that's that's just what I recall. I'm happy to share more about um, the exchanges I had with Dr. O'Leary regarding what advice she was giving versus what she gave before. I, I sent it to all of you in writing prior to the meeting as well. Thank you. Thank you, Member Levy. Thanks, Member Stein. I really appreciate that clarification because that was gonna be one of my questions. Um, so one piece of clarification, well, so first I'd like to simply state that I seconded the, the motion because I believe it is time to go mask optional. I believe that last week, that's why I voted the way I did. Um, I think it's important for us to really rely on our public health experts. And also, uh, we didn't talk about the pediatric recommendation that we got from the district pediatrician and other pediatricians who have, who have really uh, asked us to balance the, the public health risk with the psychological risk of our students. I think that's really important for us to do to also listen to the doctors. Um, I, uh, I would like to ask Superintendent Provost, my understanding is that all of the um, recommendations from, from Director O'Leary are in place. And can, can you just verify that? They are in place. To, just to add a little bit more detail to what um, Member Stein had said, at last week's, week's meeting, we received some information that was quite concerning that um, in some classrooms, HEPA filters were not running at level three. I understand the practical reasons for that. Um, we do have one classroom, for example, that has five HEPA filters in it in order to reach the um, air exchange rates that are necessary. Um, and when you have one on three, it's loud. When you have five on three, it's extremely loud. Um, but we are to, I did clarify in a communication to staff that if you have a HEPA filter or more than one HEPA filter, they all need to be on three, unless you want to um, open a window and put in window fans. Before we purchased HEPA filters, we did uh, purchase HEPA, uh, window fans for classrooms. So that is an option now, which I think with warmer temperatures, not it was too warm today, but it, they're coming, um, will make uh, the inconvenience in, of having the, the, hit, the filters running um, 
sort of neutralized. I have also followed up with the administrators to ask them to reinforce that message and to, you know, as they walk around to try to re remind people if they don't have their air filters on. And so that was the change um, from last week to this week in the, the presentation at SHAC. Thank you for that clarification. I, would, I, I really appreciate the transparency from the SHAC and from Director O'Leary. I wish we had had it last week because had we known that we simply needed to shift the settings of our HIPAA filters, I wonder if this body might have voted differently and saved us some, uh, uh, gotten us, gained us a week uh, for our students. I There are a few points that I, I do want to make. One is, um, you know, I, I do believe the science that masks do work, contrary to some of the folks uh, in public comment. And I think it's important for us to recognize as a community that removing the masks now doesn't mean that we're necessarily removing them forever. And that there is gonna be a time likely in the near future where we may have to um, have them go back on. And so I wanna make sure our public understands that, that um, these metrics allow for us to revisit that, and but that now we have those clear metrics for people to understand what it is we're looking for. Um, Superintendent Provost, I do have another question for you, which is one of the um, components are, of the of the recommendations is that students who are not fully vaccinated be masked, and I wonder if that's something that we're able to enforce. Do our teachers and our staff know? who is unvaccinated and are we able to, to ensure that they are masked? That is what has been referred to as an honor system. And I'm just gonna be very frank about it. Our health staff cannot share that information with teachers due to the privacy of medical records. We ask, and also one of the things we've said is we know that there are parents who um, may want to have support in personal decisions for masking for kids who are not required to be masked. And we cannot be in the position of being mask police around that. However, what we can do, what we've asked is not only for students who um, are required to wear a mask because they're not vaccinated, but also students who may have to wear a mask because they've either been found positive or there's been close contacts, is that the parent share that information with the school so that we can help with enforcement with that. But in reality, I will say, you know, we have been dealing with an honor system for a long time. There are people doing home tests all the time and we rely upon people to honestly report those results to us. Um, so I think we have to have a little bit of faith in our families. Okay, thank you. I, one thing that I hope we as a, a committee may be able to visit in the future is the notion of requiring a vaccination for our students. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Member Miller. Um, I guess I have a question for those who were at the SHAC meeting. Um, I'm not clear what changed Dr. O'Leary's comments or recommendations the first week, last week, and why it's changed this to this, this this week. I just wasn't clear on what the metrics were that she used to change from recommending, which we followed, that masks be used in schools. Um, to this week's recommendations, I'm just not clear on that. And um, I guess that's that's big, my biggest comment in question. Dr. Provost? So I, there may be other factors that were in Director O'Leary's um, analysis. So I you know, it's hard to it's hard to speak for someone else's mind, but I can say that I think at the meeting two weeks ago, the concern about the HEPA filtration not running at the um, at the designed level was something that I think caused some concern and, and and prevented her from feeling that she could go forward at that time. She specifically asked me to work on that, which is why I sent out the communication to staff around. HEPA filtration or window fans. And I think that 
made a difference. Um, there may have been other things, but that's that's the one thing I can speak to. Are you, Member Miller? You... Um, I'm wondering. Well, I'm, I appreciate that. I guess I wondered whether um, the other two people who were there, Member Goldman and Member uh, Stein, understood anything else or knew anything else about it or asked why <clears throat> the change. Uh, I, Member Stein's hand is up. I don't know if that was what you wanted to respond to or not, Member Stein. Um, it's uh, part and parcel. I was going to just sort of clarify something um, for Member Levy um, regarding the timeline of events and the claims of uh, the Director of Public Health. So I asked her specifically if she um, stood by the recommendation she made last week and the communications that she has sent to constituents that we have been copied on. She said yes. And I said, okay, so if you're recommending that we take off masks now, are you saying that I still recommend that you maintain the mask policy, but if you're not going to, I'd like to see you do this, this, these things. And she said, yes. And then she said, no, let me rethink that. And she said, now I'm recommending that we remove the masks. And I asked, oh, but, but I still stand behind last week's statement. And I said, okay, well, how can we understand the seeming contradiction? And she mentioned something about ventilation, but the comment about ventilation as the justification doesn't tempor temporarily line up with any of the other things we have to mark her thought process. It's not mentioned in the statement. It's not mentioned in communications to other caregivers. And as Dr. Provost mentioned, we talked about it at the meeting on the 16th and he committed and described the solution he was gonna implement. So before she even drafted or sent us a statement, the solution to the problem she was worried about had already been resolved. So I find it hard to believe that that played a decisive role in changing her opinion. I furthermore asked her if public opinion had played a role in changing her opinion. And she did say that she tends to be conservative and that she doesn't want our children on an island, which I take to be a more descriptive element of what might be driving the thought process. It could be other things, but when I look at the statement, when I look at the other responses she's given, like on the uh, this past weekend to people, there's no mention of ventilation. Um, it was addressed prior to the statement being put out. I just, I, I don't see anything that has changed in terms of the metrics. She also mentioned at the meeting on the 16th, when we were asking for metrics and when we could mask and unmask that she was very uncomfortable using case counts. And she had a very good reason for this. She said, most of the PCR testing in our area is being eliminated. So UMass is closing those down, HCC is closing those down. There's going to be less and less access to testing. And the CDC over the last month has sort of quadrupled the threshold of positive test cases in order to qualify um, uh, area as high transmissible or in order to qualify that we need to wear a mask. So she said, I'm not sure that's a really great metric. And yet now the recommendation is we use that metric. So I can't square any of this. I can just say that my impression is that the loudest voices and the most rabid voices to remove masks have prevailed in getting this back on the agenda tonight and have prevailed in swaying the recommendation. That's my opinion of things. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest otherwise. And in my questioning of uh, Director O'Leary, I wasn't given um, a rationale that made me feel like something had changed um, that would have led to this decision. Uh, it's still the case that they recommend masking when you're indoors with large numbers of people you don't live with. It's still the case that they believe in the peer reviewed studies that show that universal masking significantly reduces spread in school. It's still the case that they have concerns about privacy. None of that has changed, um, which I think is why she says she still stands behind it, but it's an impossible circle to square. So I hope that my candor is, is helpful. And I would just um, add that 
throughout this whole process, you know, in an effort to really look for numbers. Um, I, I also remember in the 16th meeting that when considering metrics before, it was discussed how conditions change that make those formulas flawed. And so that's why, you know, if you're relying on certain metrics and then those become unreliable or they're not weighing against other metrics that are shifting, it's hard to come up with a formula that doesn't, that is reliable. Um, and so I think from week to week, there's also a, a sort of examination, not of a formula, but of all the raw data pieces to determine um, what the recommendation would be, or just an understanding of where our community is at. Um, yeah, thank you. Member Levy? Um, I guess one of the things we need to determine is when this would go into effect. Uh, I would recommend Monday and put that as a friendly amendment or just- Accepted. Uh, okay. Um, and also, uh, I would like to hear from Superintendent Provost about his perspective. I think, <clears throat> Well, let me just say this this topic, this very topic came up in the shack. We were throwing out different dates that we might do for implementation if the school committee was to adopt a lifting of the mask requirement and moving to mask optional. I think that a Monday date makes sense given the fact that this, this meeting is not likely to end until the wee hours of Friday and there will have to be a communication. Um, you know, it's, it's a... I think a nuanced um, message. It's not as simple as um, students are no longer required to wear masks in schools because there are some students who are still required to wear masks in schools. There are some situations that may require us to require students to wear masks in schools. And that all needs to be developed into a letter that would have to be translated. And I think um, we would need time to, to work on that tomorrow. So I think the, the Monday implementation date um, makes sense, it's, it's probably the earliest feasible implementation date. Um, Member Davis. Oh, can you, hold on. Uh, Annie, can you make Member Davis a co-host? Oh yeah, and sorry. Member Davis, you won't be able to turn on your camera until you're, okay, you should be able to turn on your camera now if you'd like to. There you go. Thank you. And my, again, my, my apologies for having to come late since I was at my, my parent teacher conferences. So um, I heard part of this and I guess I just wanted to say that I'm here now and I'm, I'm gonna be able to say what I need to say. I couldn't unmute. So um, I'm listening and I'm present now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Robbins. Hi, thanks. And thank you for the presentation, Kaya. That was really complete. Um, it does raise more questions. I'm feeling like we're jumping to an implementation before we've, dis we've really discussed about whether this is something we're going to do. And it, this leaves a lot of holes for me. Um, when Superintendent Provost talks about the honor system, about knowing who's vaccinated, and the honor system around people reporting positives and the honor system around whether or not people are doing follow-up and who's gonna monitor that, it to me feels very vague and um, not very scientific. And you know, I know um, we did read the surveys and the surveys were overwhelmingly, we heard a lot of voices about what people wanted to have happen, but people I think generally wonder why we decided to stay with the masking last week um, and why we were unprepared with a document that would help us think about what mitigation and a plan B should the virus rear its ugly head again in large numbers. And I will say simply that um, although some of our people who spoke earlier did say that we now have representation on SHAC and we did vote to have representation on SHAC, that committee I believe had been meeting for a good portion of the epidemic uh, during the um, 
home years and there were no school committee representatives on it. And we felt it was really important for that to be a discussion that the community had a voice in and were part of. And the representation to have people on Shack has actually been really positive and helpful to me. I've really appreciated hearing their reports. But last week on March 17th, I believe was only their second meeting of attendance. And in that meeting, I believe that the discussion was largely around presenting to the fact that it was on the agenda for that night. So although we were caught short in coming up with mitigation, uh, if we took masking off and how we would do tracking and what we could do to know what if there was a, a recurrence of the virus, we were very quick to be able to say that we'll go back to the experts and ask them for some structure and some advice on how to make that happen. Since in fact, um, our last school committee working with the school administration and working with the district did a really good job of being able to implement these HEPA filters and the fans and all of the other things that we have in place, the open windows, the outdoor time, the safe lunch seating, which while it's unpleasant for children, um, they're masked while they're not eating. They're not masked while they are eating. I mean, while, while, they're, while they're done eating. Um, we do realize we need more outdoor time for them. There are a lot of things that we learned during that process about what keeps kids safe and how to, how to be out there. Um, and being caught short with the mitigation piece or with the second follow-up is something that sadly has happened to a lot of other districts who didn't have anything in place. They had something similar to this. Um, they took the masks off and they did get hit hard. I know that in Provincetown that happened with the sixth grade, 30% of the students were, um, were not in school. They were ill with COVID. They had to close down because there was no one to teach and there were no kids to teach to. That's what just happened in Concord. And I know that because I have family who live there Kids weren't masking on the buses, although they had asked them to. Um, and it flew. It flew around that school and it flew around the district. And I know that it impacted the viral infections among people who were not students, among families. And I know we're not allowed to say something personally that affected us, but ironically, one of the people infected was um, one of my sons, who is an emergency room doctor and missed 10 days of work because he had a kid in the middle school. Um, we don't, I don't know that for a fact, but he hadn't been sick with COVID before that. And that was where he was unmasking, which was at home with his family. So I, I raised those concerns. And I also want to remind us that we did a survey of the students and the comments on the survey that they shared with us were really, um, a lot of them were pretty much what you would expect. They were, I don't like wearing a mask. I'm healthy. I've been vaccinated. I need to take it off. But half of the kids who chose to comment in that survey were, were students who said, I'm really scared about taking my mask off. I'm scared for my family. I'm scared for myself. I'm scared for the, the other kids who are in my school. I don't know what's going to happen. And I understand that people are saying don't operate out of fear, but I'm also hearing those students' voices talking. And I'm wondering about this whole conversation we're having about choice. It's my, it's my choice as a parent, it's my choice as a student, it's my choice as a citizen about whether I'm going to wear a mask, which is absolutely true. And it should be a choice. It should be what comes down to it. But I'm not hearing something that's so important to me in our educational system, which is caring for others. And it makes me incredibly um, sorrowful to, to not have that be the primary discussion that we're having. And I, one of our speakers had a really lovely um, emblem on her on her screen that said she, a mask on it and says I wear it because I care and I hope that whatever decision we make tonight that the message that we send the community and that we message we send to families who are feeling fearful is that we care and that we have mitigation structures in here that that will make them feel as safe as we possibly can that we know that we can actually supervise that we know we can monitor it the pool testing is not a good rationale, I think, for knowing whether or not kids are sick, because the only people who use it are the ones who opt in. And I don't know the numbers for people who haven't opted in. But, you know, it doesn't take that much when it comes down to it. And I'm feeling like there's still a lot to discuss in this. I'm not sure what's on the budget agenda tonight, because it does require a really deep discussion and more research and more discussion with the shack experts. And my proposal would be to um, have that very serious discussion and not make a decision that implements this on Monday and be able to come in with some answers to these really large, vague honor areas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any members who have not yet spoken like to share? 
Okay, Member Stein. Um, thanks. I uh, just before I was going to say what I'm what I'm going to say. I just want to just mention something about um, what Member Robin said. I I think it's wrong to assume that personal experience. Um, that is not a conflict of interest is remotely inappropriate to bring to bear on your perspective as a representative. And I, I do not think you should feel any, any uh, um, remote compunction about um, your lived experience informing how you think as a school committee member. I think that is a very odd um, perception and I know it's one that's been shouted at us. So I'd just like to say that. Um, I have a few other things I'd like to say. Um, a few weeks ago, this committee voted nine to one to hold a special meeting on Thursday, March 17th to deliberate on the MPS mask policy. During the SHAC meeting on the 16th, Public Health Director O'Leary recommended that we maintain our mask policy. In a follow-up statement the next day, which I read during announcements, she elaborated the reasons for her support of maintaining the mask mandate. These included the recent peer reviewed studies demonstrated the significant impact of universal masking on reducing in school transmission. The issues and implementation about around privacy, which she was concerned about, um, and the standing guidance from our board of health to avoid being unmasked indoors with large groups of people that one does not live with. In light of this guidance and other issues raised in our deliberation, the school committee voted 6-1 to endorse Director O'Leary's recommendation to maintain our mask mandate. Inexplicably, one week later, we're relitigating the same issue tonight. The only thing that has evolved is not the science, but a pressure campaign by segments of the community to shift to mask optional. My understanding of events is that a meeting was held between high school students, the superintendent, and members Gazi and Agna to discuss their concerns about continuing to wear masks. Out of this meeting came the idea of another survey of high school students and a potential two week trial experiment to see how mask optional would go at the high school. The superintendent asked the director of public health ahead of the SHAC meeting to prepare recommendations for removing masks for this purpose. Allegedly other members of the committee also requested that masking again be on an agenda item. I'm incredibly disturbed by what I see as an end run around this committee's deliberations and vote a violation surely of the spirit and perhaps even the letter. We should have heard a report this evening about the meeting with the high school students and had a proper deliberation about how, if at all, we wanted to address their concerns. Instead, a few members and the superintendent decided for us. I'm troubled that no agenda setting meeting occurred where the vice chair, chair and superintendent deliberated putting this item on the agenda. And I'm disappointed in my colleagues who requested we address this again one week later. Is this a new precedent we're gonna abide by when a decision does not go our way the way we hoped or wanted? Tonight, you will hear that Director O'Leary is now recommending we drop masks and has provided some conditions that would make her comfortable in doing so. During the SHAC meeting yesterday, I questioned her about this change. And while she still stands by her statement from last week recommending we maintain universal masking, she's now recommending we do the opposite. And none of the things that she was concerned about have been alleviated. Northampton has increased cases from 21 to 38 in the past seven days. And until February 23rd, according to the CDC guidance, we would be a high transmission county. Now we're low because we moved the bar with a walk. It's my opinion that Northampton, like much of the rest of the state and country, is embracing the shift from treating the pandemic as a matter of public concern to one of personal responsibility. This has come through loud and clear from many who write to us about this issue. They are tired of doing their part and want the vulnerable to shoulder the burden independently. They often falsely argue that vaccination and quality masks are equivalent to the protection of universal masking and layered mitigation strategies. In many ways, I admire Director O'Leary for holding out as long as she did in the face of this cultural imperative and find it hard to blame her for succumbing to these social demands. At the same time, I think we need to be honest and admit that this isn't really about the science. It's about accepting three to 500,000 deaths a year and a disproportionate burden on the old, the sick, and all others who are vulnerable as the price of freedom. This is the cost of the new normal. If the committee votes tonight to rescind the mask mandate, I ask my colleagues to consider creating a hybrid or virtual option 
So children who may no longer be able to attend school due to this change can still access instruction. While this may not be permitted by DESI to count towards instructional days, I think it's the least we can do for the vulnerable in our community. Their only other option is to get on a wait list for one of the poorly performing virtual schools, homeschool, or if they don't need special education services, move to a charter that still has a mask mandate. Thanks. Um, member Davis. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to say a few short things. Um, one of them does in fact have to do with um, uh, my personal experience, which is um, in the district where I work as a elementary school teacher, masks have recently come off uh, and it was voted on and uh, the numbers um, are zero in my school and I was relieved. I am one who kept my mask on, it was optional. I guess I just want to give this as an example. Before um, um, the day came when everybody knew we could choose whether or not to wear our masks in school, it was a lot of talk about that it's, um, that some people may choose to wear their masks. And I explained why I would and why someone else would and children raised their hands and said why they would. And um, to be kind and, and an explanation as opposed to some people, I've, I, I guess I've heard from some constituents about some concerns about people that choose to wear their mask and that there might be some unkindness or um, inappropriate things said to them and there's a way to teach about how that that's not um, acceptable, I believe. Um, I would be very interested in um, somehow thinking about if we were to vote that masks, that it masks would be optional in schools, when it would be prudent to say it's time to wear masks again. And I realize that now has been, has been stated by others about um, that it's harder to grasp what numbers to use at this point because testing is so different than it was at a, at a different point. Um, how to know when and if that would um, happen. And um, the other thing is I heard, I heard member signs say something about a pressure campaign and I guess I, I guess it could be seen as that, but I just know that um, we've all gotten correspondence from our constituents that we agreed to listen to. And, um, and it's our job to listen to what people have to say and um, to make our decision and not feel that students walking out and saying, their opinion is pressure. They're allowed to say what they wanna say, I believe. And, and it's our job to listen and to make our decisions based on what we think would be best for, um, for students and, and teachers and safety. And that's all for now, thank you. Thank you, Member Gazy. technical difficulties there. Um, am I, am I allowed? Right. Okay. Yes. Um, I'd like to respond to some of the allegations and indeed aspersions, if that's the word, made by Member Stein. Um, I'd like to point out, first of all, that the reason why Member Agna and Superintendent Provost and I went to the high school the day after our meeting was because there had been a social media um, notices that encouraged students to unmask and have an unmask and go to school unmasked. And the feeling was that perhaps by having people talking to them that and explaining why they voted that way and listening to them would be maybe something that would prevent that from happening. Um, it was an amazing 
uh, situation, listening to them. Uh, and um, some of the things that really rang out to me was one student said, you know, if you're going to make big decisions like this, would you please just talk to us beforehand? Um, I, uh, other students pointed out that unlike the elementary schools, students in the cafeteria eat unmasked and talk. And the numbers there are still low. Um, and um, I know that many teachers have had conversations. I know from my uh, teacher colleagues and from my grandchildren all that have had conversations about what would happen if the mask comes off. Many teachers who have had young children have said they're going to keep them on and the students, you know, same, same them. Maybe they have uh, siblings or fragile family members. Um, so I think that I just, it's a difficult issue to have. I feel like we're going around and round. Um, I'm not sure that any of us are going to change any of our, the other members of our conversation, of our uh, committee, you know, uh, and at this point. Uh, so I don't know, can I move to, what do I do in this situation? Move, I've heard people move to call. I don't know if that's allowed. Uh, um, you could call the question. There are hands raised though. I, yeah, but- um, You'd like to call the know, question. I don't want to go back to and forth because I'm just getting all hot and bothered. And maybe I said things that, uh, um, that made Mike angry. I know I reacted to his speech so, I'm just, I'm gonna shut up now. I, you can call the question, was that what you were asking to do, Member Gazy? Well, yeah. I don't know how, I don't know what we do and I don't want, you know, I still, I especially want to hear from people that we haven't heard from because I believe we've heard a lot from the same old, same old. And I know their positions. I see a new hand up, um, Member Agna. And it is, sorry, let me just, sorry, Member Agna. So I, I do try and make sure that anyone who hasn't spoken yet speaks uh, before there's repeat. So Member Agna. So at the risk of not getting hot and bothered also, um, there are a couple things that I wanted to say and ask. The first ask is if, and this doesn't need to be answered tonight, if we're doing any of that um, wastewater testing, I, I know that that was a, a metric that was helpful to communities. And I think that if there's any way we could do that I th in order to hopefully understand where our community is going or has gone, um, as it were, excuse me to say it that way, um, I, I'd be very interested to know if we could pursue that. That's my first question. And then I have a comment, but Dr. Provost, do you wanna answer that question? Sure. At the last meeting, I had reported that the city had discontinued their wastewater treatment I, or right. testing. Right. I had said that there was some, some confusion about it. It did come up at the shack. One of the things that Meredith had shared was that in the early part of the pandemic, it was helpful in helping us to um, sort of have advanced warning for spikes of infection within the community. However, one of the issues was when we were at a much higher level of um, infection, it was kind of part of a, a regional thing because yeah. our, our wastewater is not just from Northampton. It's mm -hmm. also from Williamsburg, I believe. And so we were actually testing Williamsburg and Northampton water, plus the water from Cooley Dickinson and, and the water from um, the VA hospital. So it was a little bit um, unclear exactly how useful that information was as rates started to drop, which is why the city discontinued that program. So I just wanted to provide that additional detail. Thank you. Um, my comment is that um, I thought after our last meeting, when we voted to not lift the mandate and then heard that there was a social media campaign 
for students at NHS that they were going to have a civil disobedience of not wearing their mask the next day. I, my principal hat went on at the late hour and I did contact Dr. Provost about whether it would be helpful to a, a, an old educator to help the high school with what probably was going to be a very difficult situation with um, their students. And my practice in the past has always been, it's better to hear than to order. And I didn't think that the high school principals or teachers would wanted to be in a position of having to enforce something that was so contentious and so difficult for the community there. Um, and so much else going on at the same time. Um, so fortunately, Member Gazy was available and we did have about 250 students. I can't remember, it was a lot of students, uh, maybe 300 in the stadium. And we, they were incredibly respectful, um, generous in being able to try to understand where we were coming from and why we voted the way we did the kindness and the sense of tr real uh, um, inquiry, trying to understand this was palpable. And I was so impressed. And I, I haven't always felt that way from some of the adults who have questioned us along the way as we are facing this challenging situation. So if there are any students out there listening, I just thank you for the way that we had that meeting. And maybe because my granddaughter Franny was there, the mood was a bit lifted because she was running up and down on the, and eating her snack. But I do think that they pr were prepared to, pre would, to prepared to meet with us in a very respectful, open way. So thank you, students. And I also um, I don't know that that was anything inappropriate. And I'm I'm just wanted to do it as a public service for our community that's suffering right now. So I guess I also just need to say, I'm really sad that this is the way we're dealing with this in that I know that there are people vulnerable and I know that it is a, a scary thing. And I, I'm sorry that people have ascribed our motivations as out of fear or politics or feelings. It really isn't. It's really about trying to do the right thing according to the science. And the science is all over the place, but I, I do, I am concerned that we are putting our public health director in a position of being called out or being seen as equivocating or being seen as something that's a, a very difficult situation for her right now. I appreciate how she's trying to navigate this. And I feel like I have to just go with the facts from her. Her statement means something to me as a daughter of somebody who was a public health commissioner for a county in Ohio, I know how difficult it is to make decisions with the public health in mind. Um, but I plan to go with Miss O'Leary or Director O'Leary, and I will stay with her and get my guidance from her in my voting tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Member Agna. Um, Let's see, um, Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank Member Agna and Member Gizi for going to the high school and um, collab, you know, engaging with the high school students. I really appreciate that. Um, and I also just wanna be clear that um, I try to find what balance I can and I do not discount the fear that people are sharing with me. You are afraid, it's, that's not a bad thing. Like we respond, our emotions are important. They tell us information. Um, and I also acknowledge and recognize when people are angry, I hear your anger. I know what it's like to be angry. And so really attending to all of the feelings that people are having and, you know, paying attention to that, bringing that into the scope of what we're working with to make decisions on behalf of our community. And so I appreciate people sharing that with me. Um, and, and I am here to, you know, 
be the elected official I am. And, um, and I just really, I just really wanted to make, make that clear that, that those feelings are important um, along with the science, you know, and the professionals and the experts that we take what data we can and we weigh it against our values as a district. And that's how we find the answers that serve our community. Thank you. Um, and perhaps after this vote, someone could explain, call the question, just so that that's really clear for people, but maybe we could just wait till after the vote. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, Member Agna, may I hand control of the meeting over to you so I may comment? Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you. I will become the chair for the period of time that you are making a comment. Uh, actually, I believe according to the rules, it's until the vote. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, so there are uh, two things I wanted to say. One is that I've spoken to Director O'Leary and, and um, I talked to her about the, uh, before the communication that she shared today, I talked to her yesterday. Um, and what she shared with me is that she really felt that certain things needed to be codified or, or built into um, this policy to have her feel comfortable. And so those were all the things that um, that member Goldman read through and she felt like if that were built into the policy, she would feel um, comfortable. Um, in addition to, you know, we, I think we've talked quite a bit about the, um, the filters and, and that um, she, she was concerned that they were not being used in the way that they were meant to be to get us to the, the air uh, exchange rates that we needed. Um, so I wanted to, to share that. And additionally, I just want to say that I, you know, I really hope that as a community, we can normalize masking when people feel like they need to be masked. And you know, I know that this is something that member, I mean, uh, sorry, Director O'Leary mentioned as well, but I, I just feel like at that point um, should be underlined that in addition to the fact that we may kind of go back and forth between times when we may need to be masked, I, I want us to really work hard as a community um, to have everyone feel comfortable wearing a mask when they feel like they need to or want to wear a mask. And um, I think that is a responsibility of all of us to, to really um, allow that space for people to make those decisions and have it not even be a topic of conversation, that this is just something that people um, should do when they, they feel they need to do it. So I hope um, that we can all work really hard as a community to um, have people feel comfortable to make those decisions. Um, so thank you for allowing me to share that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know that Member Gazy tried to call the question and I know that Member Miller and Member Stein have had a chance to speak. I don't know if we, if I mean, the, Member Goldman did ask what it means to call a question. So can I answer that? Oh, I love it. Thank you, Member Levy. My understanding is that when, when somebody calls the question, doesn't matter how many hands are up, we vote as we have to vote as to whether we will then vote. Uh, so, so people can call the question at any time. They can call the question before there's been any discussion. I don't think it's a great idea, but, but we vote on yes, we're, we agree we're ready to vote or no, we're gonna continue the conversation. And if the, the yes is win, then the people whose hands are up don't, don't talk. I don't know if Dr. Provost wants to amend that, but. Just slightly, I believe by our rules, it needs to be super majority. I think um, I would turn to our parliamentarian on that, but I think it's not just a, a simple majority to, to successfully call the question. I could be wrong. Um, I'm gonna have to look that up. Um, um, Superintendent Provost, is that in the uh, rules of procedure? <laughs> okay, I'm I'll not, look in the rules I'm of procedure. Sure. I'll check Robert's rules. How's that? I'll, I'll, and then I'll we'll have them this. both. I, I, I'm pretty, I have that card upstairs, and this would be the first time that I've used it uh, that MASC gave me. Um, okay, I will, I don't, ah, yes, Mayor, there it is. Uh, there is a call, the question, or maybe an end debate um, 
um, motion on there? Uh, closed debate? Yes. Two thirds vote. Okay. I will just clarify that in the future, if somebody says I'd like to call the question, even if there are people who haven't spoken and whose hands are up, they still don't get to talk if we vote for it. So I think it might be unfair to member Stein to not let him speak right now, given that all these other people have spoken after member Gazy tried to call the question. But okay. so that maybe we do it the, the, well, the right way next time around. Okay, I agree we should start fresh because I think I got to talk after member Gazy called the question. So I, mm -hmm. I agree with you on that one, but let's remember that for future. So member Stein. Yeah, I just want to, um, I think potentially that member Gazy misunderstood my comments about the high school meeting. I actually think that was a fantastic idea. And it was clear to me from the students I've heard from and from the educators that it was extremely effective and that the students entirely appreciated you and the superintendent and, and member Agna coming there and they felt seen and they felt heard in ways they hadn't in a long time. And I think that was crucially important. My issue was not with that at all. I don't think that was inappropriate. I thought that was an excellent idea. And I thank you as members for stepping up and doing that for the district. Um, so what I, what I said in my, in my comments was not about that. It was about what happened after that in light of what we did the prior week. So you'll remember last Thursday night, we voted to endorse the director of public health's recommendation. And as part of that vote, we asked her, uh, we, we, the shack was asked, not tasked, to come up with a list of metrics that we could use for the future. Now, what ended up happening is a request was made, a different request was put to the, the shack um, ahead of the shack meeting, which was, can you develop some guidelines for us to do a trial at the high school? And also there was this, this uh, move to do another survey. And from my perspective, since we voted as a committee and deliberated on the past survey, and we voted to ask Shaq for a particular thing, that it's, it was inappropriate for those things to happen. I don't fault either member Agner or member Gazy for that. I think that was the, the, the thing that uh, procedurally upsets me. Um, so just to, just to be clear, I'm incredibly grateful um, the work you did to defuse the situation at the high school. I'm concerned about the procedural issues that precipitated us being here tonight. Okay, thank you, Member Stein. Member Miller. Um, I just wanted to, I had not been able to express my opinion yet. And um, I think as a public meeting and as a public servant, I need to explain why I am going, voted the last time, but also why I've shifted my mind. Um, I think last time I was absolutely following the directive of, uh, of Meredith O'Leary and I respect her opinion um, and I value it. But I guess what has swayed me somewhat and that I'm very concerned about as a child psychologist, I am very concerned about the impact on children of um, having to wear a mask when they have any speech and language difficulties, um, second language learners, um, those who are hard of hearing as I am. Um, the, how difficult it is to communicate effectively with a mask and not to be able to read facial expressions and not to be able to read communication that's nonverbal is very difficult, especially also for kids on the spectrum. So um, I my opinions have shifted because um, of those issues mostly, and um, also because I do appreciate um, what uh, Director O'Leary has said both last week and this week. Thank you. Thank you, Member Miller. Should we now go to the calling of the question that Member Gazy asked for? 
No, oh, since there are no hands, we just vote. Yeah, that's what I was okay. going to say. Once, once all the hands are done, then we can. Okay, great. So, Andy, will you do a roll call, please? I'm sorry. Can can the um, motion be restated? It's been a long discussion. Yes, I'm happy to. Thank you. Um, the motion to amend policy EBCFA face masks and face coverings to align with the guidance and recommendations presented in the Director of Health O'Leary's statement and a friendly amendment that this would go into effect on Monday, March 28th. Okay, thank you, Annie. Now, can we have a roll call? Member Robbins. I'm gonna vote no, because I, I agree with the first two parts and not with the latter part. Thank you. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. No. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you, Member Seraphie Cox. Um, no. Okay, thank you. Member Stein. No. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Scarra. Yes. The vote is seven in favor, three opposed. Thank you, that passes. Thank you, Member Agna. Um, uh, yes, Member Serafi Cox. Apologies, I didn't get my hand up before the vote. Um, uh, I just wanted to clarify, the, the motion was to amend the, um, the face mask policy according to that um, Member O'Leary's statement, um, but who is actually going to incorporate Member O'Leary's statement into the policy it is my question. And honestly, that's the, that's the reason I voted no. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just, I, I had my rules and policy subcommittee hat on in that moment. And that's my question. Okay. Um, Annie, is that something that you feel you could add uh, these, the recommendations to the policy? I do feel that I could add them without subtracting anything else, I, if that is the instructions. Uh, Member Levy, did you have something there? Mine is unrelated. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm having connectivity issues and I've joined on my phone. So okay. Annie, I'm gonna leave my computer can you co-host my phone so that I can unmute in the future? Yes, I just need to find your phone. Can you co-host a phone? Oh no, you can't co-host a phone. That's right. Um, okay, well, I'll be, I'll try and fix things fast, but for now okay. I'm on my phone. Sorry about that. Um, I guess I would ask for uh, Dr. Provost's guidance on that, on the policy. I do think there might have to be some subtractions because the first part of the existing policy talks about the requirement for all students to wear masks. I certainly would be able to um, offer assistance, but I, I do think that what you said earlier about adding new um, language without subtracting any language would not be uh, reflective of the vote that was just taken. Okay. Okay, so um, member Serafi Cox, are we comfortable with having um, Dr. Provost and Annie make the changes to reflect the vote? Yes, yes, I just wanted to make sure it happened. Thank you. Thank you for doing that, appreciate it. Okay, um, that brings us to item B under new business, which is discussion and possible vote on the FY23 budget. Dr. Provost, and I'm on the lookout for members. Thank you, there, there actually was another item ahead of that, which was um, an exemption for junior prom, which 
may seem like it doesn't make as much of a difference now that the whole policy has been changed, but it might make sense to do it anyway, since one of the um, one of the pieces of the policy that was just passed says the SHAC may reimpose the mask mandate um, for all students. And um, there will not be an opportunity for the school committee to vote prior to prom. So um, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's not on the agenda that I've pulled up for some reason, but um, oh. I do remember that it had been on there. So I, I must be looking at an older version. I apologize. Um, yes, can someone uh, can you someone read what that item is for me since I don't have it in front of me? Does it have to be a member? I'm happy to read it if you want me to read it. Uh, uh, vote to waive the NPS mask requirement for students and guests participating in the NHS Junior Prom on Friday, April 8th. Great, thank you. Um, and Dr. Provost, was, were you the person who was attached to that? Sure, I, and I just explained the reason why it may be still worthwhile to take the vote. Um, one of the things that I would say was pointed out by the advisor on this is this is different than school. It's not required. Um, this is a voluntary event. Um, and so even if there was a situation where we were requiring masks in schools, they were asking for relief from the mask requirement for the prom. Um, okay. Uh, Member Gazy, and if there was a motion, that would be great. I can't hear you, Member Gacy. There you go. I just want to quickly ask where the Junior Plum takes place. Is it, it's not on campus, right? This one is going to be on school campus. That's why the, oh, it is. the rule needs to be addressed. I see. Um, Member Sarafi Cox. Um, the version of the agenda that is in our packets does not have this item on it. So, I do want to make sure that the publicly noticed version of the agenda had it on it. Um, I'm checking the city website. And um, member Dina is uh, saying that she can't unmute. So she would like me to share that they should follow the guidelines that are in place on that date. Like if rates go up and we have to put masks back on, they should wear masks. If masks stay off, fine. <laughs> um, uh, yes, uh, just to interject, yes, the it is on the agenda. The vote Great. for the prom is on the agenda on the city website. And I apologize for having an old version in the packet. Okay. Glad it wasn't just me. Um, okay, so, it, so it's okay for us to put this on the floor. Um, uh, yeah, member Robbins. What's up? I think my hand was up, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not gonna vote on this, but I can tell you a little more about it because my granddaughter is on that committee. And she, I did have the discussion with her about if there were still masking. And she said it's going to be in the end of the cafeteria and out behind the cafeteria. The doors would be open. The windows would be open. And even though they're going to wear short dresses, they're willing to get cold. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, is there a motion, please? Uh, Member Robbins, it, was that a motion? No, I don't think I can because I am related to the presenter, right? I'm too involved. Okay. Um, okay. So moved. Someone, who was that? So moved. Okay. Member Goldman uh, made the motion. I'm seconded. And, and seconded by Member Agnes. Thank you. Any further discussion? I, I have a... <clears throat> this is member Davis. Um, I have a question about whether or not I also should remove myself from the vote. My, one of my 
children will be attending, but she's not involved with the planning. Am I allowed to vote or should I mm -hmm. also not be involved in that? No, I, I believe you can vote, but um, okay. Dr. Provost, did you wanna? I, I believe that you both can vote. I mean, the, the conflict of interest goes to if if you have really if you have a financial interest. So, you know, if you have a relative was the DJ for the event or a vendor for the event where you had, you know, a a very real financial stake in whether or not, you know, how well attended this is, then I think there could be a potential conflict. But just because you have someone who may be going to the dancer is on the organizing committee, I don't think disqualifies you from being able to vote. And I'm, I'm happy to vote. I just wanted to be really careful because I did speak with her about how to present this issue. So that's great. I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, roll call please, Danny. Member, member Gacy. <clears throat> This is to this is to allow them to go maskless, right? Right, to waive the mask requirement uh, if there yes. were to be one. Yes. Uh, Member Sophie Cox. Yes. Member Stein. No. Member Levy. I don't think we have Member Levy back yet. Um. Okay, hold on. you can request to unmute her. I I'm looking for is it the phone number that is here? Oh um, not one of the iPhone. There are two iPhones. No, there are three iPhones. I mean if it's a if it's a phone number, phone number, then then it would be a five one zero phone number. Yeah, that's not that's not the num that's not the number. So I'm guessing it's one of the multiple iPhones. I just don't know which one. Um, it says my name, she says. Oh, okay. okay. Hold on. You're right. Okay. Here we go. Okay. I'm asking to un unmute. Okay. Hi. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Now you found me. Thank you. Um, I vote no. Member Miller? Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Sciara. Yes. And Member Robbins. Yes, and I hope they'll be smart, safe, and have a great time. Uh, the vote is eight in favor, two opposed. Okay, that passes. And now we are moving to item C, which is a discussion and possible vote of the FY23 budget. Thank you very much. Let me start by saying one of the things I'm proud of is the amount of public participation we have in the budget process in Northampton. Just for the information of folks who may not have seen this in other districts, the requirement is that the um, district hold a public hearing on the budget before voting. In most other places I've been, that means the business manager and superintendent present the budget, and then there's a public comment period and the, the school committee immediately votes. Um, this is will actually be the fourth discussion of the budget. Um, you had the first few budget. We had a long budget discussion last week when Nick was going through the budget detail. And then uh, two weeks ago when Nick was going through the budget detail, I had a um, all school councils meeting where I was able to run through the budget with the members of all the school councils in our district. And so now this is the fourth time we're meeting to talk about budget. I think that um, the details of it are very clear at this point. I think the feedback that we've gotten has been clear and consistent. Um, I would say the, the things in the budget that have drawn the most um, controversy are the reduction from three to two teams at sixth grade and some of the other uh, potential reductions at the elementary level. Since we have discussed it in such detail, I'm not going to go through um, the entire budget again, but I'm just going to limit uh, discussion or our discussion tonight to answering questions 
that have come up in that process. So I know that Nick has provided you some information and I've provided you some information that I'd like to run through because that's what this, the community hasn't seen yet. I would uh, let Nick go first with his pieces and then I will share my pieces. Good evening, Nick. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, so the part that I'm gonna discuss is when, um, when we were going through the budget book a couple of weeks ago and we were looking at the page with the proposed staffing changes for next year, <laughs> um, member Levy had asked if, um, if there was a way that, you know, the cost for each of those positions would be able to be included with, with that page, um, which it makes a lot of sense in the updated document that I'd sent you um, I, I would plan to just include that in the budget book for subsequent years. So, so that way it's there. Um, so, you know, basically what I'd shared with you and what you all have in your packet is, is what the associated savings and or um, cost of the, the proposed um, additions and reductions for next year would be. Um, I also included the transfers in there as well, um, as you know, in our proposal. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're, we're proposing that the reading interventionists from JFK uh, move to two of the elementary schools. So I, I included that there to you know show you that the uh, and there would be no cost or, or savings there it would equal itself. But um, I guess what I would do now is ask if anybody has any questions about the um, document that I shared with you. I'm not seeing any. I mean, would anybody like me to share my screen just so everybody can see it? That would be great because I can't find the thing that you're talking about right now in my massive inbox. All right, just give me one moment to, to find it here in my computer. You should be able to share, Nick. Tell me if you can't. We've had a difficult evening in terms of Zoom. Uh, yeah, I've just got a, I got a rote. Oh, no. It's also Virginia. in the packet if it's easier for you to find it there. Yeah, I found it. Uh, apparently the version of Adobe on my computer is not allowing me to rotate it. So if I were to share my screen, okay. um, everybody would see it like vertically, which would not really be great. Okay. Um, does anybody else have it um, readily available that they could share? Well, I maybe would just point out to Member Gizzi that is it is in the the folder on um, on Google Drive that um, where all of the information for this meeting is. So you don't have to necessarily go through your email to find it. Oh, I figured it out actually. It it I found a way to do it. Just give me one moment. Um, staffing changes. All right, so here's the proposed staffing changes that I presented two weeks ago with the um, associated savings and costs. Um, <clears throat> you'll see that all of the additions um, fall in the other funding category. Um, the Bridge Street Interventionist would be paid for with SR3 funding. Uh, we propose to increase uh, the Bridge Street um, Reading Interventionist um, up to a 0.8 from 8.6. Um, that would be paid for with Title I funding. Um, and then the uh, academic coaches for JFK would also be paid for with ESSER three money. So all of the additions would be coming from other funding. Um, the reductions largely come from the local budget um, it, with the exception of um, approximately two thirds of the grant coordinator salary, um, which would have been paid with indirect costs um, from the various grants that the district has. Um, and then at the bottom, you see the transfers there, um, they, they equal themselves out. So um, with this proposed budget, uh, we would um, save $345,838. Um, and, and local budget money that can be allocated elsewhere. Um, and, you know, we would add um, money to the other funding category. Member Gazy. 
Um, I really can't support the cutting of the first grade teacher at Jackson, the sixth grade teacher, and all of the ESPs. Uh, I think that the pandemic um, has, uh, I, well, I think there's no more important constituents in this city than our children. Um, they are our future leaders and teachers play a vital role in educating them to take, uh, to assume their roles in our community. And I believe that teachers are the unsung heroes of the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has torn the fabric of our society. Teachers are struggling to catch students up academically, as well as supporting the increased social and emotional needs engendered by this time of COVID. So I just cannot support a budget that cuts student facing positions First grade is a critical learning year as children learn to read and adapt to their learning community. Sixth grade as well is a major transition year. Um, at this critical time, I don't think that instructional coaches are nearly as important as teachers and ESPs. I would far prefer that we use instructional coach, the instructional coach money for teachers. Um, and I also think it is appropriate that paying for ESPs in the first grade with ESSER funds is a good use of pandemic recovery. Um, I understand that using ESSER funds is that one of the problems of using ESSER funds is that it is a Band-Aid, a one-year Band-Aid, and that next year those funds will probably not be available to sustain these jobs in coming years. But this isn't a time, this is a time when we need a Band-Aid. If it isn't a time when we need a Band-Aid, then I don't know what is. So I really can't vote for a budget as it's laid out in this uh, manner. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gazy. Uh, Member Robbins. So I have a question. Um, I heard from teachers the other day that they feel as though the budget's being balanced on the back of having lost um, teachers who cost a whole lot more who left during the pandemic or after the pandemic. And I think the number they gave us for their school, uh, JFK was $225,000. So teachers who cost a lot more, who for one reason or another, because we haven't done ex exit interviews are no longer with us. And I'm curious to know how we would have made this budget work had those um, more expensive senior teachers stayed because I am totally in accord with member Gazy about the priority of keeping teachers and ESPs and sticking anything we can into the ESSER to get us through wherever we need to get through. And I know it raises questions about unemployment or something or afterwards, but I don't really understand how we can't just keep moving towards a better financial future. And I have a lot of faith in future legislation that may benefit us before we get to that point. So my question is around, had those experienced teachers stayed, how would we have made this work? Well, I mean, I, I would have had to see exactly what, you know, their salaries for next year would have been, you know, in total. Um, you know, obviously then our bottom line number would have been, you know, much higher than it, it is and, and then, you know, what you would likely do is, is look to other areas of the budget to see what you could do to get the bottom line to where you needed it to be. Dr. Provis? I just wanted to provide some context on that. So to answer the question directly, I, I believe the difference in turnover at that school, we're talking about the middle school, is about $240,000 give or take, um, it's in excess of $200,000 anyways. But I do think it's important um, to give some context on what the district re staffing retention rate is, um, because all this of course has to do with retention. And the Department of Ed provides that data on three groups, um, superintendent, principal, and teachers. So your 20, 
22 staffing retention for superintendent was 100% as compared to a statewide average of 81.3. Your retention of principals was 100% as opposed to a statewide total of 85.5 and your sta staffing retention for teachers was 90% as opposed to a statewide total of 86.8. So um, it is true that in that one school, there was um, a lot of turnover with more experienced staff being replaced by less experienced staff. But overall, um, we've done much better than the state in, in weathering retention through COVID. So I think it's important that the community knows that. Um, member Serafi Cox. Um, I, I understand that there is a, um, a relationship between the adding of academic coaches and the moving of interventionists. Can, can that complex puzzle be explained one more time? I apologize. Uh, Yes, and it can easily be exchanged, explained that we're, the two items are at this point delinked. Um, we would, we would want to send the reading staff to the elementary schools to support better reading, um, better reading interventions, better reading outcomes out there, regardless of whatever is done. I think the only thing that would stop us from doing that is if, you know, the committee said to eliminate those positions, but if they stay, our recommendation is to put them at the elementary level. Uh, you're saying those positions, meaning the interventionists. That's right. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, can't speak for my colleagues, but I can't imagine <laughs> that happened. Um, okay, uh, I would um, I would like to put a motion on the floor. Um, and of course, I know that there will be continued discussion. Um, but just to kind of uh, at, at most test the waters. Um, so my motion would be that I would move to approve the budget with the following changes. Uh, to restore the first grade ESPs utilizing ESSER's funds with the understanding that this is temporary funding and could only guarantee those positions for one year. Um, to restore uh, a sixth grade, the sixth grade teacher position uh, to only hire one coach. Um, and an aside, I would be open to, to, to changing that um, if, if folks have other thoughts on the coaches, but um, I was basically just looking at the math that not hiring one of the coaches basically pays for the first grade ESPs. Um, and th that's, those are the budget changes that I have kind of thought through in my brain uh, in terms of moving things around. Um, um, but as I said, I'm definitely open to, to, uh, to changing additional things around. Um, so just to reiterate, the motion would be to um, approve the budget with the following changes, restore the first grade ESPs with ESSER's funds, only hire one coach, and uh, restore the uh, sixth grade uh, teacher um, at the middle school. Okay, that's the motion. Annie, you have that motion? Um, yes, I've got it. Thank you. And is there a second? Motion is made by member Serafi Cox. Oh, second. Seconded by member Davis. Um, further, just, do you want, do you want to discuss that further member Serafi Cox or nope, hands down. Okay. Um, member Goldman. Thank you. Um, thank you member Serafi Cox uh, for getting a motion on the floor. Um, okay. So uh I appreciate the understanding about the ESPs that would be paid by ESSER funds and it would provide them with the one year. Um, and so, and then I have questions about the sixth grade teacher piece and the hiring one coach. My understanding is that the 
reading and math interventionists that are at JFK would transition, as you just confirmed, Superintendent Provost, to the elementary schools to manage some of the reading and math needs that you know we really want to pump up uh, in the elementary schools. That currently those um, reading and math interventionists are at JFK, and if they are transferred to the elementary schools. Um, I'm concerned about what reading and math support the students and faculty would have, uh, students and educators would have at JFK when those go. My understanding is that that's where the coaches come in. We're hiring two coaches, one in math and one in reading to be at JFK to provide that support when the uh, direct interventionists are moved to the elementary schools. And so having one coach wouldn't really cut it because the coaches tend to be reading or math. And so those coaches would be at JFK to provide, provide, to cover both of those um, areas. So can, when, and especially when you talk about unlinking them, I was concerned that if we were, um, if we were going with the interventionalist trans moving, shifting to the elementary schools, that then my question would be, what are we doing about math? Um, and reading at JFK. Dr. Provost and Nick, you both have your hands up. So whichever one of you wants to go first. Sure, so uh, just a clarification. There's a 0.6 reading teacher in JFK and a 0.8 reading teacher at JFK. The recommendation is to move both of those to the elementary level. So it's not reading and math, it's reading only. Um, there are reading, I mean, there are, there is math intervention that is um, included in the budget as well. As um, you may recall, the culture coach position ended up leaving money on the table because that position was not able to be filled for the entire year. Um, we, so we will be able to provide math support at the, at the middle school level through that. Um, I believe that, you know, one thing we could do with coach positions if they were um, approved in order to try to, provide more direct support to staff as we could also ask them to teach a class. Um, so one of the things that um, we would be able to do with coaches at, at the middle school level, since they would only be focused on that level is they could be put into a rotation in the way that coaches that go into all four elementary schools can't. So that's one way we could address some reading support. Although I will say, if you're only able to provide um, one coach, then I think it should be a math coach because that's the middle school's greatest need. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanna say about that. Okay, so um, if we were to hire only one coach, again, we would have the reading interventionist transfer from JFK to the elementary schools. We would bring one coach in to provide math, you said, uh, at JFK, and they would both have the load of of doing that coaching position, but also be in rotation. In what grades would they be in rotation at um, JFK? Would it be sixth grade or would it be seventh and eighth? Uh, that's something that I would want to consult with the school staff about, but my, of course. my gut is probably sixth grade. Historically, we've had more difficulty um, with math performance in the sixth grade than we have had at seventh and eighth. So, but I, I would, I would want to, take a look at the actual needs of the students before committing to that. And you believe that the um, JFK educators would and students would be supported in reading without hiring? The, what support would, the, would JFK students and educators receive in reading? So they would receive reading in either level one which is the general education classroom, or they'd receive it in level three, which is special ed. The, the level two piece wouldn't be there, and that is a loss. Um, it's about, you know, trying to put our resources where we can use them most effectively. You know, every bit of research I've read on reading instruction says the time to intervene is early. Um, right. So our hope is that if we can um, do a better job of sending students up to the middle school with solid reading skills, there won't be such a need for intervention at the middle school level. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and then in terms of the sixth grade teacher previous in the um, budget proposal, the sixth grade um, team teacher would, 
uh, the third team would be closed. It would be a two team sixth grade. That teacher would go to become the social one of the social studies teachers for seventh and eighth grade. Is that That's right? correct. That's correct. And so if we were to maintain the sixth grade team teacher um, so that we had three teams in the sixth grade, I'm wondering like how that might work. We would would we use ESSER funds to hold that position for one year and would you we'd still need to hire a social studies teacher for seventh and eighth grade, right? So not only are we maintaining the cost of the sixth grade team teacher, but then we're adding, we're not adding the cost for the social studies teacher, right? Because that's already in the budget. Well, essentially in the reduction to two teams, the salary that is saved is the seventh or eighth grade social studies teacher um, because the sixth grade teacher goes to fill that position. So you wouldn't be refilling it from, that, that's where your savings comes. Right, and okay. Um, and then I guess the question is just, it sounds like that sixth grade teacher for team three, the proposal um, member, Sarah Fee Cox, in your motion would be that, that that wouldn't be an ESSER funding position like the ESPs, but that would just, just stay in place. Correct. Is that right? Okay, thank you. That's the questions I have for now. Um, Annie. Member Levy is back in the meeting. Um, could you please make her a co-host? Um, okay, Member Robbins. Thanks. Um, I don't know if this is the time to make a friendly amendment to Member Seraphie Cox's amendment. Can I? Sure. Okay. Um, and I want to say, um, add that the first grade teacher into that as well. Um, so you can make it, but then member Sarah Cox needs to accept right. it as a friendly amendment. If okay, so I'm making a friendly amendment to add a first grade teacher into that amendment. So the first grade teacher at Jackson Street. Jackson Street. Um, so the so then we're looking at um, basically a hundred thousand, a little over a hundred thousand dollars extra cost that we're putting back into the budget. A hundred and seven, um, I think. Uh huh. Um, so I would. Uh, um, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a friendly amendment so that it can be a part of the discussion. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm nervous about it though. Um, and, and would like to also talk about um, like, how do we balance this? Thank you. Um, uh, Member Agna. Um, I'm hopeful that we will have a ballot question success in the fall so that there may be more revenue. I know we can't count our chickens before, but I do think that that is something to keep in mind if we are going to use ESSER funds to restore or to keep the ESPs and the sixth grade teacher at least. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm hopeful that that might come through. My other um, comment, I guess, is in spite of what was said during public comment, I do actually think about what the professionals think and do and their planning for their um, program of studies and their, their um, budget proposals. And so I'm feeling very caught because I participated in budget development for the last for 24 years in that we as the professionals on the alt team had to make some hard decisions. And I, I don't want to take a side, I guess. I want to know what the professionals feel. I know that we know what the professionals as the teachers feel, that it's what a compromise it would be for them 
at the sixth grade level and in the first grade as far as losing a teacher and all of the ESPs right now. But I also am with, I have two lenses. My other lens is that the all team had to wrestle with all of these decisions in order to try to come up with a, the best budget that they could given the limited funds that they are given. So I don't know exactly what I need to say about this, except that I am definitely somebody who is thinking about what the professionals are thinking at this point and do not want to micromanage them and either by taking away positions that they don't want taken away or making them try to find money in the in this very, very challenging budget situation. So I'm I'm really very I'm really struggling with this right now. And I don't know whether Dr. Provost or Nick in the uh, could shed some light on the process that would have to happen as far as going back to the alt team who would then also have to go back to their teachers to try to figure out how to manage this situation. So can you, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's hard for me to understand exactly what the question in that was. It, if, if there's a reduction, let's just say, then we would have to go back and figure out what further reduction would need to be. If there was an addition and you said, if you tell us specifically what positions to, to put back in, then there is no more discussion, right? right? The only question is if you tell us to put back in these positions, but then still give us a budget that's with the same amount, then we have to go and talk about where, where else can we make cuts in order to get down to the same amount. What I understand is on the floor right now is to increase the amount of the budget. Um, so that wouldn't require more discussion. But in increasing the amount of the budget, where does that increase come from? Um, basically, it comes from the future. It makes the problem that you're going to face next year that much harder. Unless that budget um, passes, you know, that, that, that amendment passes and things come forward. I see that Dina disagrees with that. <laughs> I do. I can wait till it's my turn. But I, my understanding is that the what the proposal is that aside from the first grade position, what member Seraphie Cox proposed was would be balanced. That that we're not asking for more money. We she's figured out how to get the positions by taking away other positions. Am I misunderstanding that? Member Seraphie Cox, you want to respond? Looks like she disagrees with your disagreement. <laughs> um, I agree with that for the first grade ESPs. Um, for the sixth grade teacher, uh, be, I, I I am uncertain how you know how that how that balances, and I I wanted to kind of open it for discussion. Um, uh, the superintendent is basically right that I was uh, I was proposing to increase the budget by the 50 some thousand dollars um i thought you were taking away a coach yes uh, in order it, the coach is in esser's money and the coach uh, would pay for the esps that uh, would uh, be in esser's you. money thank you for clarifying that yeah i mean i guess if you wanted we could take away another coach and pay for the sixth grade teacher through Esser's money for one year. But that's, you know, that's, that's getting really dicey. And that that's the sort of thing that, that uh, um, I want to call you member Bernier that Nick uh, <laughs> had said, you know, uh, was, uh, as I said, dicey. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's single time money. And um, well, he said it better than I. So that's exactly why I was concerned, however, in terms of making decisions to take away a coach, for instance, that I don't know if the school leadership feels that that is more important than the ESPs. And I'm really sorry to say it that way, because I, I know that that's a really tricky thing to come up to say, but I know that having participated in budget 
discussions and then development, sometimes these decisions are made that way. Dr. Provost. So I wanted to say something and then I know uh, Principal Caldwell is on the call and you know I'd, I'd like to make some space for him to, to respond if the, if the chair will recognize him. You know, I think one of the things that is very um, true is that COVID has been difficult on everybody. And with all of the, all of the um, new protocols we have in place, what's happening for the middle school in particular is all the administrative time is being um, taken up with monitoring students. So they really feel in a bind to be able to provide the sort of instructional leadership that you know principals are also tasked with doing. So the the I I would say from their perspective, the coach is essential if you want to have instructional leadership happening, um, because so much administrative time is is taken up with all of the stuff with COVID. But I'm sure. I'm sure Principal Caldwell could speak to that point and tell you what it's like to actually live the life of a middle school principal right now much better than I can. Um, I'm very happy to recognize Principal Caldwell. Annie, can you please make Principal Caldwell a co-host or make me a host and then I can take care of making people co-host, but I just wanna make sure that he can not just unmute, which I will ask him to do, but also if he'd like to turn on his camera, he has the uh, ability to do so. Okay, Principal Caldwell, you should be able to unmute and turn on your camera if you'd like. Right. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, so oh wait, I can kind of hear you, but very, very barely. Okay, let's see. Can anyone else hear him? No. Yeah, we can't hear, we can hear you like- Is this any better? A little bit better. I'm sorry, I'm on my cell phone. Okay. Um, and is this any better? No, that was slightly worse. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Um, <clears throat> I think that's okay. This might, be, this might be difficult. Um. All right, so it looks like this may be the best it's gonna be. Yep, I think we can work with this. Okay. We're all leaning in. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will try to speak loudly without waking up the uh, entire house. Understood. Thank you. Um, so, um, so I want to acknowledge that this is, um, this is, this is tough, um, especially because I know the impact um, on the community. I know the impact uh, on my staff and the emotions and feelings behind um, this particular budget. Um, I also want to name that um, from day one, um, so, so I actually was going to speak during um, public comment um, and had wrote a speech that I is, is not in front of me anymore. Um, so I'm trying to sort of wing it, but um, As far as um, the coaches go, um, I, th I think it's important to note that right now, um, one third of the day for uh, all three administrators in the building is spent in the cafeteria covering um, lunches. Um, we're still spread out, we're all over the place. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty much how we spend our day. Um, the idea that as building leaders, we are instructional leaders is not accurate at this point. Like right now we are um, so focused on um, keeping everyone safe and keeping things orderly that as far as getting into classrooms and supporting our staff um, through coaching, it's not really happening. Um, very, very little. Um, making it to team meetings to be able to discuss all the things that uh, make up the middle school model um, and being collaborative the way we'd like to, not really happening. 
Um, and so something has to change in order for us to really make the um, improvements that we all want to see happen at the middle school. And so coaching um, long before I thought there was ever going to be a budget impact, um, I've since day one had a um, instructional uh, vision that included every staff member in the building having a coach and having a uh, professional coaching plan. That's just part of improving um, at the work that we do. Um, so it is difficult for me to hear that we had an opportunity to have coaches, um, even if it's just for a couple years, um, and then hear that, okay, we're not going to have coaches. Um, and that potentially means we're also not going to have other things. Um, I can tell you that it will also mean that teachers are not going to have all the observations that they um, are, are required to have. And they're certainly not going to get all of the feedback um, that they, they deserve to get in order to help everyone um, grow. Um, and so that's difficult. Um, one of the things that uh, came to mind for me was if we're not getting coaches, then I, and, and we're looking at, um, you know, student facing positions, then I'm gonna need another member to my team, either as an associate principal or as a, um, uh, a dean of culture or someone who can step in and fill in um, some of those um, spaces so that it would free up um, uh, myself um, and, and hopefully, um, another uh, administrator in the building to really be able to focus on those um, instructional leadership uh, roles that we're supposed to be focusing our attention on. Um, so I get it, this is difficult and I'm not um, you know, the ultimate decision maker. Um, basically, you know, what, what I'm going to do is you're going to tell me what my staffing is and I'm going to do the best I can to make that work for all of our students um, and for my staff who, you know, clearly are, um, you know, really feeling it this year um, with that lack of, of support. Um, and so, I don't know what the answer is. I, 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 sh I would love for the middle school to lose nothing and just gain additional coaches. Um, I'll answer whatever questions um, you may have for me, um, but I just think it's important to just put it out there that um, this, is, this is a situation that, that we're dealing with. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're holding things together, um, but we're not currently really being the instructional leaders that we really truly want to be and being able to be in classrooms consistently and providing uh, feedback, which is what we you know, are supposed to do. That, that's the real job of a principal and of an associate principal, not lunch duty, not monitoring hallways um, and not you know, um, dealing with you know, those, those other, um, you know, elements that, that come along with, with, um, you know, students who are struggling. Um, and, you know, I don't want to paint this as, you know, the, you know, the school is, is full of kids who are really struggling, but, um, you know, our students have needs and we're going to meet those needs. And, and some of those needs are immediate needs and they keep taking, precedent over um, those other pieces of the job that we really know are the pieces that are going to push our school where we want our school to go. And if we're not getting coaches, you know, my question is, well, we can't keep doing the same thing and thinking, okay, well, it's just going to get better on its own. What's going to happen? What, what, what are we getting? What are we doing that is going to, um, you know, 
get us to where we need to get to um, if we're not um, providing those supports because our teachers are working beyond hard to you know to get at, to to do all the things that that are needed um, and we really need to to be supporting them Thank you, Principal Caldwell. Uh, Member Levy, did you have a question for Principal Caldwell? People have hands up, but if people, if there are specific questions for Principal Caldwell, maybe we can do those first. So Member Levy. Thanks, yeah, I had my hand up for something else, but I do have, I actually have two questions for Principal Caldwell, if that's okay. First, Principal Caldwell, thank you so much for joining us and for, for speaking and for giving us a sense of what's going on. It, it raises for me a question of, um, of causation, I guess. And I, you know, wish I had brought my crystal ball with me to this conversation and, and I unfortunately don't have it. I, I, I know obviously none of us know what's happening in the near future with regard to COVID, with regard to hiring, with regard to staffing. But my understanding is pre-COVID, this was not the case. And so, in terms of the ways that that the leadership at the at the middle school were spending their time, perhaps it was. I'm not sure, but I guess I'm curious. So my first question to you is, what would need to change in order for you to not need to spend your time in the cafeteria and doing the things that you're doing right now? Well, one of the things that. Um... COVID precautions have brought uh, into the mix is um, there are times this school year where we had three different lunch locations, right? So now we have two lunch locations um, that are on opposite ends of the school. And so we have students that are just, you know, all over the place. Like they have to go to one location to get their lunch and then potentially uh, move across the campus to go to another location to have their lunch. And so those places have to have supervision, right? So if we were, you know, everyone was eating in one location, um, then I think, you know, that reduces some of the need. Um, if we weren't um, doing pool testing uh, for half of a, you know, school day just about um, once a week, then, you know, that's, you know, a, a, you know, an, an administrator doesn't need to be um, in that space. I mean, some of this is, you know, related to like, this is, this is what the job requires right now. Um, and so it is, you know, certainly, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to come across as, as complaining, um, but I'm, I'm recognizing that, you know, I don't know when these things are going to change. I don't know when we're going to be at a place where we can say, okay, everyone in the same cafeteria um, and, and, and students and, and um, are going to feel comfortable coming, you know, all everyone back to that one space. Um, you know, we certainly don't want kids hiding out and not eating lunch because they don't feel comfortable being in, in, in one space. Um, and so we're just spread out in ways that I don't think we have been. Um, I will say that um, teachers getting um, observations and, and getting regular feedback, um, I th that's not something new. Um, it is something that, you know, really should be happening um, fairly regularly um, and is something that um, I think is, you know, I, I would say is a, is a staple in um in a building that that I've worked in, you know, it's just natural to walk around the school and spend time in classrooms and, you know, leave notes or, you know, quick emails about, um, you know, things that um, you saw in the classroom and, and, and you know, providing that feedback. Um, we're just, we're just pulled in directions that we, we can't really do that right now. And I don't know that, you know, that's all of a sudden going to change next year. Um, you know, yeah. so yeah, okay. so I, I, there, there are a lot of different pieces to it, I think. Okay. Thank you so much. That also brings clarity and I appreciate that. My other question is less about the role of the coach and more about whether you can share with us 
your perspective and um, understanding of the uh, reduction of a sixth grade teacher or team. Um, I, we, the, the curriculum subcommittee heard an incredibly compelling presentation from the sixth grade team where they detailed for us the numbers of how many students would be in each class, how many, um, how many sections for each teacher, um, if, if a sixth grade team were eliminated or if one were, were maintained. And there was also a communication first, lots of support for you, lots of gratitude for your open communication, but also a feeling of that this was a surprise to them, that, that they weren't really a part of the conversation about whether this was best. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can just help us better understand the process behind that, um, as behind your recommendation that, that a team be eliminated from the sixth grade, uh, as well as your reasoning for why that's the right move right now. Obviously, like if we were rolling in money, it probably wouldn't happen, but given, but why that's the choice you're making or you decided to make in terms of your budget recommendation? So I, I want to be careful with the, the words that are, that are being used. Um, it is never my recommendation to have less staff, um, especially when I'm saying I need more people so that I, I can do the things that I really want to do to support the people I have. Um, there have been conversations uh, about moving to two teams um, with the same number of staff we currently have in place. Um, that discussion um, has been ongoing um, and was a discussion that um, I thought was fairly exciting um, and had lots of support. Um, the main reason is that our sixth grade teachers are being asked to teach three different subjects each day. So they are planning for and delivering instruction um, as English teachers, as reading teachers, and then an additional subject area, which is taxing. I mean, it, it is so much to ask. And the fact that they've done it, some of them for, a decade is is just, I mean, beyond commendable. Um, and there's there was an idea that if we moved to two teams and we kept the same number of staff members, um, that we might be able to get them down to teaching two subjects. And perhaps if we did it, um, correctly, maybe down to just one subject area. Um, and so if they're able to do amazing things, planning for three different classes, um, what could they accomplish just planning for one? Uh, this move um, from a budgetary standpoint, having to eliminate one uh, increases class sizes in a way that going to two teams um, with the same number of teachers would not have. So it would still increase the number of students that they interacted with um, as far as team size goes, but it would have reduced the number of students uh, in the classrooms with them. So that is something that we had discussed um, with an eye on reducing the number of preps they had every day. Um, when we look at the school and we're looking at the budget and where um, there is a, uh, a, a potential for a, um, a reduction, that is the space in the building that um, a change would still allow the team or the, the um, would not be taking away a course from students. 
Um, so there really is no other um, position that we could eliminate and say, uh, we just, you know, where we, th those students can be absorbed somewhere else. And so um, again, it is certainly not ideal. Um, the ideal situation for me would be that seventh and eighth grade also were uh, uh, three teams and that class sizes were as small as they could be and that everyone was uh, only teaching one um, subject area. And, um, you know, we had common planning time um, and we had uh, common team times. Um, and, you know, we're building out our STEAM programs. I mean, I I've got a whole lot of things. We got coaches, you know, all throughout the building. Um, everyone has coaching me. That's, that's my vision for what I would love to happen. Um, we unfortunately were not there to be able to do that. Um, I certainly were, you know, I haven't really been able to talk with my teams about, you know, what their, you know, suggestions are as far as if we end up in a situation where the team is reduced by one. Um, because having those conversations at this point um, borders on uh, direct dealing, and I'm not, you know, part of uh, any of those those committees. So I've got to be careful with, you know, all those, you know, those conversations and trying to navigate um, and, you know, listening, but you know, not sort of suggesting or leaning. Um, so, you know, again, I, I don't want this to, to, you know, be sort of uh, delivered as, you know, Des wants to have one less sixth grade teacher um, as much as, um, you know, we are in a budget situation where if we have to reduce um, things at the middle school, that's the space that makes the most sense. Um, and I, you know, I still want our, um, you know, I, st I, st I still want our, uh, you know, all of our programs to, to be in place. Um, and I do, rec you know, and again, I recognize that there are, you know, concerns with, the transition and, and all those other pieces, but um, you know, I, I don't know where another position at the middle school. What you know, what else? Anything else that could have been um, eliminated, especially because the um, you know some of the supports were already moving uh, to to the elementary, um, so you know they're they're just really wasn't anything that wasn't connected to Essers that, you know, we, we could really take from. Thanks so much. Mayor, you're muted. I was asking you, Dr. Provost, if you wanted to respond. I also just wanted to add something else to this. Um, I wanted to circle back to what Principal Caldwell was saying about trying to make the workload more manageable for teachers, which is, I, you know, it may seem ironic that with one less teacher, the workload is more manageable. But those of you who are at the uh, budget or at the curriculum subcommittee yesterday saw the difference in what the teaching loads would look like um, in terms of kids, but also in terms of subject. And with the two team model, which is the same model that we have in seventh and eighth grade, they would be, teachers would be responsible for fewer subjects. And, you know, this, I, I wanna give the middle school full credit for this. This is, you know, something they've been talking about for a long time. This isn't a John idea, but I, when, when Principal Caldwell was hired, I asked him if he could take a look at, to see if the structures were the right structures in the school because we've had a consistent situation where 
there is a performance difference in seventh and eighth grade as, as compared to sixth grade. The teachers have changed, the kids have changed, the administrators have changed, but the same thing still happens, um, which makes leads me to believe, well, maybe the structure we have is set up because it's just asking them to do too much, teaching all those different um, subjects. So um, I wanna bring it back to students and I wanna bring it back to uh, performance and achievement because that also was an important component of this, at least from my perspective. Could, could I add one more piece? Of course. Um, so one of the things that we have discussed, and, and I wasn't at the meeting yesterday, so I, I don't know if this came up, um, but um, if we were able to have a, um, a, a program or curriculum, um, a reading program or curriculum at the sixth grade level where our teachers were able to have a, um, you know, tier one, but also um, tier two intervention sort of built in, um, that would also be a great opportunity to take um, a portion of planning um, off of their plates because um, whether, you know, we, we maintain the three team model or we move to the two team model, um, there's still going to be multiple um, courses that they're being asked to plan. Um, and so if, you know, if we were able to, um, you know, find funds for that, uh, that would be awesome for, you know, in my mind um, to, to be able to support them in that way as well. Um, again, like the, the amount of work that they are putting in, um, and I've only known them, you know, through, through COVID times, um, they're, they're absolutely amazing. And, you know, I, I want to support them um, in every way that, that we're able uh, to support them. Thank you, Principal Pogo. Um, Okay, were there other questions specifically for Principal Caldwell? If so, okay, I see hand, hand, real hands. Um, I'm gonna go to member Seraphie Cox and then member Gazy. Thank you. And thank you, Principal Caldwell, for staying up with us. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, not having the time to do um, the, the things that, are the core elements of your work. And when I hear that, what I hear is, well, we need to support you to not have to do those other things. And I think that was, uh, you know, member Levy's question kind of got at that a bit. Um, and, and, I, and I hear you that you um, didn't, you know, didn't have a ready answer. Uh, and so I, I guess I'm just left with, can you maybe tell me like, why can't, uh, it, it, I'm sure that it's not this simple, but why can't we hire uh, somebody to watch lunch, to cover lunch in order to free you and your administrators up during that time? I mean, lunch monitors, if that's what they're doing are gonna be a, a bit cheaper than, than you and your, your administrators. Um, and, and then my second question is, what I heard you saying was that coaches were going to help with ensuring that teachers have the proper evaluations. And so maybe I misunderstood that, but that makes it sound like the coaches are doing the teacher evaluations. And I, I'm sure that that's not what you meant, but that's what I heard. Thank you. Thank you for clear, clearing that up. Um, so yeah, let me let me speak to both of those. Um, first, um, I want I want to start with the coaches. And no, coaches would not be um, doing uh, evaluations. Um, my so that was that was uh, two two separate things um, that I was I was saying there. Um, coaches would be able to be in the classrooms and be um, able to work with teachers and help support them and um, help coach them on um, whatever uh, building priorities um, we, you know, we, we, we landed on. Um, but the important piece would be that um, there was someone 
who was able to be in the classrooms and providing feedback and support to teachers. Um, the other piece I was saying was, if we're saying that we don't want um, coaches, and it sounded like, and I could be wrong, it sounded like we were saying we didn't want coaches because they are not um, student facing, um, then having uh, roles like, um, you know, the culture coach or a dean of culture or someone in that, that kind of role who uh, could work with students and do some of the things that we're doing um, would free us up to be able to be in the classrooms and um, uh, uh, get, uh, doing observations, giving feedback, and taking on that um, that work that uh, the coaches would be work would be doing if um, admin continued to to be in the roles that we're we're currently in. Um, the other question uh, about having other people um, do the work, um, it's, we just don't have the, the staff right now. Um, I am short, it's either six or seven ESPs. Um, I flat out cannot hire. Um, I've offered, I don't know how many jobs um, ESPs are looking at, or, or candidates are looking at the pay and um you know that's 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 the end of the conversation um we get to you know some of them will get to the point where they're you know they receive their offer and they're like no i, I can't do that um our esps um in our building are spending so much time uh covering classes um that you know those who would have been on lunch duty um, can't do lunch duty because they are uh, covering classes. Um, and so, you know, that's, that also becomes um, a bit of a concern. Um, and so when it all boils down, the people who are, um, that we know are going to be available and um, can be in those spaces um, end up being um, uh the, the, you know, the, the principal and the associate principal. And there are, you know, other staff members who are assigned um, to, to help support the place, the, the spaces. Um, but if we've got, you know, students in the cafeteria, we've got students who are participating in recess, we've got students um, having lunch in the community room, uh, we've got students who are um, sitting and the tables outside the cafeteria, um, that's a lot of spaces that we need bodies um, to to support. Um, and then you can't just have one person in each of the spaces based on the number of students. Um, and so, you know, we're, you know, there, there's, there's a, a, a large need for staff to do that. Um, I would love if it were as simple as um, hiring um, lunch monitors. Um, but we're, you know, we, we just, we don't, we don't have, you know, that, that luxury. Um, also middle school, you know, you students really need people they have relationships with, um, uh, uh, supervising them, um, people who know the, you know, know and understand the building and where kids should be and, and, and how to, uh, interact with them, um, when they're, you know, maybe not doing exactly what, what you're asking them to do. Um, and a lot of times that ends up being, um, you know, school leaders that are, that are doing, doing that work. Um, member Gazy, you also had a question for Principal Caldwell, yes? Thank you, Principal Caldwell. I certainly appreciate um, your administrative viewpoint on the question of coaches versus a teacher, um, because I've only heard before from teachers who were pretty adamant that way. And so I really um, appreciate the opportunity to get the big over picture. Um, 
I was what. I was wondering, I thought I heard you say sort of as an addendum that, that an interventionist position would be almost as valuable to your teachers in relieving the load of their prep load. Um, is, is that what you meant? Um, because if so, would an inter having an interventionist instead of a coach be a solution? So an interventionist, um, I don't, I don't think so. Um, because the job of the interventionist would be to support the students, um, where, uh, be it, um, through tutoring, be it through, um, uh, you know, working in small with students in small groups or um, pushing into classrooms to support uh, the learning in, in the larger classroom environment, uh, maybe pulling out small groups. Um, if we're talking about, um, if you're talking about an academic interventionist, um, I'm assuming that's, that's what you're talking yeah. about, um, yeah. where a coach, uh, their focus would be, so we could ask, we could actually ask a coach to teach some portion of the day, um, which I believe, I mean, I was, I was an academic coach and I did, and I think that that, you know, is, is a great model. Um, but there, uh, you know, the value there is them being able to work with uh, teachers, being able to spend time in the classroom, um, helping, helping to, um, to, uh, support specific things, you know, um, you know, I, I remember as a coach, um, you know, a teacher might come in and say, Hey, um, could you help me with, you know, this particular strategy? So I'm coming in and I'm, uh, focused specifically on a particular strategy. And then, uh, during that, you know, teachers planning time, um, I'm, you know, meeting with them and we're talking through a particular strategy. We're talking through uh, different moves that um, that that uh, teacher could use um, to better implement um, whatever it is uh, they're working on. We might talk through, um, you know, curriculum and, and how can I uh, simultaneously reach the students that are struggling while also really pushing the students who are flying through the material? Like, how do I differentiate um, to that degree. Um, and a coach is able to, again, come into the classroom and they may have planned with you. Um, so they know exactly what the execution um, could and should look like. And they can give feedback on, well, you know, this was the point where you could have done this thing or that thing, or, you know, don't forget this move. Um, and, you know, interventionist isn't going to do that, that level, have that level of, of uh, impact on the classroom teacher, um, they're gonna have that impact directly on the student that they're working with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, okay, are there, I wanna let Principal Caldwell go um, if there are no other questions for him. So I just wanna check and make sure there's nothing else specifically for him. Okay, Principal Caldwell, I don't see any other questions. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate you um, allowing me um, an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Um, okay, so moving back into the uh, hands up, um, Member Stein. I am. Um... Just wanted to acknowledge a few things and uh, before I, I have a friendly amendment to offer member Seraphie Cox, I need to ask Nick for a figure before I do that. But um, I just really want to acknowledge the difficult situation that the superintendent and Nick and Principal Caldwell all find themselves in. I thought it was important to hear Principal Caldwell say, I don't want this to be sold as I want a limited sixth grade teacher. Clearly that is not the case. Um, 
And I really appreciate his willingness to speak with us and to engage with us. It's, it's wonderful to hear directly from him. I wish I was able to attend the curriculum committee yesterday to hear from the teachers um, because it really gives you a sense of um, what sort of trade-offs and what sort of difficult decisions folks are thinking about and how completely they're trying to think about them. So I'm incredibly grateful for that and I, I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, before I, I need to ask Nick, what, if you could give me, it doesn't have to be down to the penny or anything, but what is the total dollar figure we would need in order to avoid eliminating student facing positions that we're discussing tonight? It doesn't have to be exact, but. Well, do you, do you mean all the reductions there? Yeah. Well, it would be, it would pretty much be the bottom line. Well, minus the grant coordinator, um, it would be the bottom line on that sheet that I shared the uh, at the beginning of my part of this, because um, the, the grant coordinator obviously wouldn't be a student facing position, but um, everybody else would be. So you take the 345, 838 and subtract 20,000, it would be 325,838 approximately. Okay, and, and from... Uh... Does that change at all um, based on the other friendly amendment about using Esther's money? Does that come down at all? Well, if we move the, the grade one ESPs to Esther, then that would, you know, take approximately $90,000 off of that, which would then, you know, get you down to, um, sorry, it's late. My mental math That's okay. is uh, <laughs> what, 325 to about 235, 838. Okay. Um, is what that would get you. Thank you. Um, super helpful. Um, uh, so the friendly amendment I'd like to make um, to member Seraphie Cox is to um, send a statement to our colleagues and friends in the city council requesting that they increase the allotment to the school's section of the budget by $250,000 which is, I don't know, point something percent of the 105 million or whatever the total budget is, um, in order so we do not have to lose front facing, um, or not front facing, student facing um, members of our, of our teams in the schools. It's a request, it's, they don't have to agree with it, it's just a request. And uh, so that I understand the, the friendly amendment that you're offering, Member Stein, we would still pass the budget? So we would, we would the, the motion would still be to, to move, to pass the budget, restoring the positions that are um, student facing moving grade one ESPs to ESSERS and requesting basically that the city cover the additional $250,000 of the budget that that would require. Yes, and I think that's somewhat problematic and I don't know the solution to that, so. <laughs> yeah, um, can I <laughs> jump in for a second? I, I mean, if, if you pass the budget with the appropriation that we're asking for, which would be um, $34,800,372, um, you know, with, with the friendly amendment, um, we'd be in a bind if the city council then said no, um, because we'd be stuck with, you know, 200 and, you know, 50-ish thousand dollars of, of salaries that we're not going to be able to pay for. But if we, right. pa if we pass it with... Um the original friendly amendments that shifted some money and then accepted some cuts, but also included that request. Um, does that not put us in the bind, but it would allow us if it was granted to not have to make the cuts? There, that was like a double or triple negative. Can you sorry. say that again? <laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> what I'm asking, I'm sorry, I know it's late. Um, what I'm asking is if we pass the, um, 
the motion to pass the budget with the changes that have been, you know, I think accepted as friendly amendments to pay for first grade ESPs with ESSER funds. And I think there was another shift as well, right? Or maybe not. Um, if we pass that budget, but also include my friendly amendment to request this additional $250,000 from the city council, mm -hmm. um, if we pass it that way, does that avoid the bind that we're talking about, uh, Nick, um, and allow us to actually keep these people if it's approved? Can, can I just answer this question quickly? Because I, I can answer this. Um, so I think there's a misunderstanding of, of the council's role in the budget. The, the council can only reduce the budget. They cannot make additions to the budget. Um, and they cannot reallocate funds. So they can reduce the budget, but not reallocate it. Um, so uh, if, I don't know where, where you got the idea. Um, there is a provision in Mass General Law, but that is only if the mayor puts forward a budget that is less than what the school committee has voted for, for the schools, um, then the council may increase the school the school budget to meet what was voted on by uh, the school committee. Um, but I would never do that. I would never put forward a budget that was uh, provided less for the schools than was voted on by the school committee. Any, any more discussion on that? Or should I move on to the next member? I see the superintendent's waving his hand. Oh, sorry, Dr. Provost. I'm just would ask who, whoever the next member is to look at the time and oh, um, consider my. suspending you. rules. <clears throat> is there a motion? So moved. Uh, I would move to suspend rules for one hour. Second. Motion made by member Sarah Cox and seconded by who? Uh, I had member Goldman. Member Goldman, okay. Um, any discussion on that suspension? Roll call please, Annie. Member Sarah Cox? Yes. Member Stein? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Miller? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Agna? Yes. Member Davis? Yes. <clears throat> Mayor Sciarra? Yes. Member Robbins? Yes. And Member Gazy? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Provost. Um, Member Robbins, I think you're next. Thank you. Um, I, and I just quickly want to, I know this is difficult to try to figure out, but going back to the sixth grade piece, I'm going to remind us about, well, one thing we did hear from teachers yesterday was one of the reasons they are really keen to keep their classes small is because of the relationship they have with their students. And the more kids you add to the class, the less capability they have that. And I don't know what the challenge is about that relationship and any other uh, behavioral issues or um, attending to needs that they can't get to. I was intrigued by the idea of the coaches being able to do teaching in the classroom. I didn't know that was within um, their contractual purview, but part of our dip is to have teachers in our schools have the opportunity to do peer visits with other classrooms. And I don't know how much opportunity we've given teachers to make that happen, but if we have coaches in that building who could teach classes and free up teachers to be able to take a question to go visit another teacher who has a question about their practice or have someone in their classroom to, to visit it, it would seem to me that, that the whole point of that is to grow a culture of people talking about where things are working well and where there are challenges and sharing really good ideas. So I'm rethinking the, the idea about having the coaches maybe um, support some of the need that folks have for an ESP in that setting. And 
I also want to remind us that one of the things we don't talk about in funding both the sixth grade and the first grade teacher is the amount of constituent feedback we've had about, I'm going to go elsewhere. And every student that we have who chooses to educate in another setting is costs us money. We cost us revenue into the system in one way or another. And I don't know how we've anticipated that or put it down. I did look at the number of students who are at the Hilltown Charter School who are in the middle school, and it's an amazing number. I actually wrote it down somewhere. It's, I think it's in the 50s between grades six and eight. And, uh, and I keep coming back to this piece about how, how do we have people feel like they want to have their kids educated in their city school. And if we if we go ahead and remove this position and aren't incredibly creative about being able to fund these and move forward, what is the precedent that we're setting for people to simply say, I'm not going to send my kid to middle school here. And we have heard a lot of feedback around people who have said exactly that. And I know I've heard from people who have already made inquiries or even been accepted into another program. And it does need to be a serious part of this discussion. Thank you. Uh, Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, I really uh, appreciate this conversation and um, thank you, Member Agna, for um, weighing in on the other side of the conversation as we're talking about where we don't want to be um, making cuts, but from the sound of it, from what I've understood in um, my meetings with um, Nick and also with the budget committee that a lot of of the spaces when we're looking for a way to balance the budget right we're trying to we're just trying to balance the budget we're trying to figure out how to spend the money we have um, is is to figure out where that can even happen you know in a lot of spaces it's just we we can't make these cuts because these are the only places um, and um, so I really, I respect that. At the same time, um, I think there has, I, there is a legitimate concerns about, you know, these six-year-olds and these um, students moving up to the middle school. So I actually wonder, Member Serafi Cox, if you would accept a significant friendly amendment, which would actually be rather than uh, making a motion to pass a budget tonight with these revisions, to not vote on the budget tonight and rather to make a motion to direct the superintendent to provide a revised budget proposal with the changes that would include um, bringing the first grade ESPs and the sixth grade team teacher uh, back in. And not um, um, ask for uh like mm, can you hold on to that until after i've spoken because i have a i have a question to clarify how uh the mayor answered um member stein earlier sure yeah and my intention really is for us to um i we have one more meeting before we mm -hmm. have to pass this budget and i just want to make sure that we're not just talking about um, adding debt to the budget, like unbalancing the budget, but making sure we're working with, we are voting on a balanced budget. And if we can't, if, if we can't make the shifts that we want to make in the new budget, it needs to happen, um, at, at this point, I, I just, I'm, I'm not interested in voting for a budget that I don't know is balanced. And so that's why I would move to move away from a vote on a budget and move towards asking to see what the change, what a balanced budget would look like with the changes we're asking for. Thank you. Member Serafi Cox. Um, so in what I heard of your answer to member Stein and he offered a friendly amendment and I didn't answer because I was like trying to process what you, uh, what you um, responded to him. Um, so what I heard you say was basically, if the school committee were to pass a budget of a certain amount, basically whatever amount that is, hopefully within reason, we wouldn't pass a $17 trillion budget, um, that 
that you would not propose a budget to the city that was less than the amount that we passed. So if, if we were to pass the budget tonight that increased the, uh, the, the size of the budget by, um, by $50,000 or $100,000, what I heard you say was that then that would be the amount that you would allocate in the city's budget. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would advocate for a budget that can be balanced, but what I was explaining was, was the provisions in Mass General Law, which is that the city council cannot increase a budget. They can only reduce a budget. Um, and then there's this one tiny provision, but I've never seen it happen in Northampton because one, because the mayor is on the school committee um, yeah. and, and votes on that budget. Um, and because we're not a community where the mayor has ever tried to slash the school budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then the council would then have to step in and support what the school committee had asked for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, um, I, I I do think it's possible that we're not ready to, to vote on this tonight. I do think that, you know, we've tried the tact before of, or tactic, uh, before of asking the superintendent to come back with, you know, how he would suggest to balance the budget uh, based on our priorities. And we haven't liked what he's come back with because it's cutting other things that we like. So, um, I think that that's, that's the, the difficult um, position that I find myself in, in terms of um, accepting member Goldman's friendly amendment. So uh, um, at, uh, I'm open to postponing the vote, but I, uh, I'm not gonna accept uh, member Goldman's friendly amendment at this time. Um, member Levy. Um, is the motion on the floor, does it include a friendly amendment to add back in the first grade teacher at Jackson Street? It does. Okay. I, I have questions about that. Obviously, I think small class sizes, maybe not obviously, I think small class sizes are ideal. And I think losing teachers is not ideal. Um, Am I remembering correctly that there are 41 incoming first graders at Jackson Street if, if all of the kindergartners from Jackson Street return? I don't know why that number is in my head. Uh, I, let me go back to a prior packet. I'm just looking through the budget book. I can get there quicker, I think. I remember that first grade teacher saying she had 41 reasons why. She didn't think it should happen. Thanks. Yeah, there's there's 41 current kindergartners at Jackson Street spread across three sections. Okay. So that math is fantastic. Like, gosh, I wish we could have three sections at 41 students in all of our schools. It strikes me that if we keep a first grade teacher at Jackson Street, and we maintain 41 students, um, that that puts Jackson Street pretty out of whack in comparison to other class sizes at the other schools. Is that incorrect? Uh, if three, or if we go to two, I'm sorry, which, which way did you ask if, it? If we maintain three. If we maintain three, their class sizes would be much smaller than the other schools. Yeah. Um, I, I wish that we could keep that first grade teacher. It seems like given all of the conversations we're having about where we've got to prioritize, I don't want anybody to come away saying I am 
anti small classes. I am pro small classes. I want all of our classes to be as small as they could be. If we have to prioritize to me, I would, um, not prioritize keeping that first grade teacher at Jackson Street, given given those numbers and given the other decisions that we have to make. So I wouldn't be able to support the motion on the floor as it currently stands. Um, Member Miller. First of all, um, could you repeat the motion on the floor because my understanding was that you were going to use ESSER funds for the ESPs for first grade and you were going to keep the sixth grade position so that there could be three teams at JFK um, because that is my I'm really concerned about um, keeping that position in sixth grade because of the all the kids moving up from fifth grade and their needs and having three teams is a priority to me. Um, and I just want to, could you just repeat the motion? Can I just quickly say, um, Member Miller, that yes, you are correct that that, that is the those things are included in the motion. I did not stipulate how many teams there would be. I heard Principal Caldwell say that moving to two teams was a was a potential plan. You know that that he was um, working to implement with the faculty. But I also heard him say that he would rather do that as the faculty would rather do that with a higher level of staffing. Um, so I, I, I did not stipulate in my motion how many teams there would be. Okay, okay. Do, do you wanna hear the motion still? Yes. Uh, uh, to approve the budget with the following changes to restore the first grade ESPs using, utilizing ESSER's funds with the understanding that this is temporary funding uh, and only guaranteed for one year, to restore the sixth grade teacher position, to only hire one coach, uh, and then there was a friendly amendment to add the first grade teacher back in, which was accepted. Um, so it can be part of the discussion. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Provost, did you? Yes, so you know there were um, many things to share tonight. I'm ec ecstatic that no one wanted to hear my stuff and went right into motions because they want to get the budget passed. But I did want to point out that Dave Pru is here to talk about the questions that came up about Title IX last time. If those are still relevant, I would hope, you know, I, I just want people to know he's here so that maybe we could go to those and um, we could let him go. Um, are there, oh, um, Member Levy, did you have a question about, specifically about that? No, sorry. I, it just occurred to me I wanted to put my hand up for something else. <clears throat> Poor timing that it coincided with that. Sorry. Okay. Um, are there questions? Um, yes, I, uh, I, Member I Davis. Think, I think that this is relevant um, to what we were talking about, and I think it's short. I'm wondering regarding the um, the motion and the ESSER funds idea to fund that um, the first grade um, ESPs. What is our obligation on the school committee, a role or obligation on the school committee to look further ahead to the big picture? Because it solves the problem for the period, short period of time. Like, does it, is it our role to look ahead and say, it's, does it feel like a Band-Aid or not? Like it helps for the year and maybe that's what the ESSER funds are for anyway, right? Um, I don't know, it, it's a, it was a thought. Um, that's all I'm just gonna put out there because it's troubling to me that then it would go away and we would still maybe wish they were still there, that's all. 
Thank you, Member Davis. Um, I, I don't know, Nick or um, Dr. Provost, if you want to answer that, but before, I'm sorry, Dr. Provost, who did you say was here? Dave Pru. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Pru? I just want to make sure there are not. Okay, I don't I mean, think so. it, Well, it sounded like uh, um, the superintendent said that there were questions from last meeting that, that um, Mr. Pru was here to um, address. That's right. Specifically, Member Serafi Cox had some questions about um, whether there were Title IX issues with the athletic budget. Okay. Um, why am I not seeing? Oh, David P. Perhaps. Um, okay. I'm gonna ask you to un. Oops. Yeah. Are you unmuted? Yep. And we can, if you um, want to turn your camera, Annie, could you make? Yeah, it's saying I can't. Yeah, Annie, could you make? Um, okay, you're a co-host now. You should be able to, David. Perfect. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Um, thanks for um, giving me the floor. Um, yeah, uh, Nick and John um, brought the comments to me after last week's meeting. Um, you know, I, I pulled up the, the budget that I um, submitted um, to Nick and looked at it. And, um, you know, the few areas where if you're looking at, you know, the same sport in, in, in two genders, like girls soccer and boys soccer, boys basketball, girls basketball, baseball, softball. Um, and, you know, I, I used the template that was from the FY22 um, budgeting doc document that was passed on to me. Um, I felt so in those three instances, we have three teams for the boys side, uh, varsity, JV and freshmen, um, as opposed to varsity JV, but no freshman teams in the girls sports in those categories. So from a transportation standpoint, from an official standpoint, um, from a coaching staff standpoint, there would be an increase in costs in, um, in, you know, the, the boys programs and those because of the, the number of teams. Um, I decided to, um, if you wanted me to resubmit something, I added a column to the budget to um, display the number of teams um, that would encompass the budget per each sport. Um, I felt like that was probably something that maybe should have been in the document from from years before as well, just so you can see, um, you know, how many teams are accounted for in that budget line. Um, you know, there are a couple other places that I looked. Um, EMT and police coverage um, is only listed on football and, and boys basketball, and that was something that I passed over from the previous year, and, and it basically. Um, you know, as going through the operations of, of athletics for this first year in this position, uh, I think it's just tied to, um, you know, the two sports with the greatest amount of attendance and need um, for additional, um, you know, security presence for crowd control and, um, you know, the cash boxes that are there. However, once we had, um, instituted the attendance restrictions at the boys basketball or, or at the, at the, um, you know, over the winter that I removed the police detail for, for those games that I had things scheduled. So, um, but I did put the placeholder back and then the only, the, the other area, um, where there were discrepancies where it wasn't, um, you know, spread out across all the sports was that my uniform line, um, and that is trying to determine, you know, um, as I enter a uniform rotation, um, you know, on average, I'm hoping that each sport gets um, ideally six years out of their uniforms, but more realistically, depending on indoor, outdoor sport, amount of usage, usually you're looking at a four to six year rotation. And, um, you know, as I started doing inventory this year, when I came in, just trying to target 
a rotation of, of teams that are going to um, be up for, for uniforms. So, for example, I have 3,000 in there for boys soccer, zero for girls soccer. But this year's season, girls soccer have brand new uniforms. Um, so they won't be up for a certain amount of years. Um, but as I look at it, I have girls cross country up for uniforms next year. Not as much. It doesn't cost as much as the, the soccer uniforms. Um, but just trying to, as I look through year to year, trying to make sure I, I you know, update uniforms uh, for, for both genders um, with different teams. And, you know, a few years in this position, I'll, I'll have a pretty solid, you know, plan of rotation year after year. Um, but I think that's where the biggest differences were. Officials, transportation, the rotation of uniforms, and then, um, you know, there was the EMT police coverage in a couple of the male sports. Thank you. Yeah. Member Sarah Cox, did you have any other? I mean, that was very helpful. And uh, I think you're right that um, that the number of teams or the number of players or, you know, something like that, um, um, or the ratio, you know, we, uh, in, in terms of uh, teachers, we look at the teacher to student ratio. So I don't know, coach to student, uh, student player ratio. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the budget as it is now, but I, um, I, I would like to continue the conversation um, about, well, why don't the girls sports have a freshman team? You know, some of those like, uh, longer term planning um, yeah. or, or longer term equity questions. Um, but I'm good for now. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Um, are there other questions for David? Okay. I don't think I see, there are a lot of hands, but tell me if they're, wave at me if they're for right this moment. I'm not seeing any. Thank you so much for joining us. They would appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, good night. Good night. Um, Dr. Provost, did you, was there something you wanted to add before oh, I go back? No, to I just forgot to put my hand down, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, that brings us to Member Davis. Member Davis? Are they, uh, nope. Okay. Oh, I think she forgot to put her hand down too. Okay, that uh, member Robbins. Oh, you just muted. I know, I know I did it. Um, I feel like we're really close on this, and I know that there is a motion on the floor, and I just I and that it would be nice to settle this tonight. I would still like to say that we are so close to being able to make this happen, and I think if we keep working at it, we, we've come up with some great ideas. We can come back again and have a look. We've learned a lot tonight. It was really great for Principal Caldwell to come and talk to us about the coaches and have a chance to think about it through that light. Um, but it, I would really appreciate being able to finish this at the next meeting and then and ask uh, our representatives on the budget <clears throat> committee to follow up on what our requests are in terms of finding this additional piece of money uh, and trying to be creative about it, looking, I know we've asked for it before, but asking for it again, looking in any kind of area that we possibly can to float that for this year and to meet those needs, because we are remarkably close, if you ask me. And I know how creative people are in being able to dig a little bit deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Member Levy. Uh, oh, sorry, I've been unmuted for a long time. Hope you, didn't. you were quiet. No, I would have muted you if you were being rambunctious. Thank you. Um, I okay. So I guess Member Robbins is asking that we not pass this tonight, uh, which I might be able to get behind. Um, I was going to offer a friendly amendment to remove the friendly amendment regarding the first grade. Uh, at Jackson Street. I still want to do that. And then I guess we can see if, if it passes or not. So I, I put that forward to member therapy talks. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I had uh, accepted the friendly amendment in the first place to kind of hear the, 
the the discussion about it. Um, but I I, I think that uh, of, of of the priorities that I have, um, I would be comfortable with that. So removing that friendly amendment, then the motion goes back to my original motion. Got that, Annie? I did. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, the budget subcommittee is meeting on Thursday, so we'd have an opportunity to dive into this. Um, I just wanted to be clear, maybe member Seraphie Cox, you can, I think you would be able to explain this well, but if we have the motion on the floor, we're gonna vote. If we vote yes, then this would be the budget. And if we vote no, then, um, we either need to put another motion on the floor for another budget proposal, like, uh, or we might decide to vote to not vote tonight. Do we need to make a vote to not vote tonight? Or are we just right? It would be a vote to to a vote to wait to table a vote to table. Okay. Um. And are you interested in still holding the vote? <laughs> and I'll make a friendly amendment to table it just to see what your inclination is, which, which one you wanna vote on. Sure. Um, I, I didn't know that there was a budget uh, subcommittee meeting. Uh, it's this coming Thursday, you said? Thursday the 31st. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't know that there was a, a meeting then. That that does make me feel more comfortable about tabling. Um, but I uh, I think that the that the the priorities of the committee um, ho hopefully it feels feels clear in terms of like what I've I've put forward. Um, the only piece I'm not as clear on is the coach piece. But mm -hmm. um, that might that might come out, you know, when we move the numbers around um, to to look at the what's on the table. Sure. Yeah. Having the ESPs is more important to me than not having the coaches. So, <laughs> or the one coach, anyway. Uh, so you were offering a friendly amendment to just table until our next meeting and to have the budget committee discuss it at their next meeting. Is that correct? Right. Do we need to refer it to the budget committee? Uh, I mean, if that's a part of the motion, that's what would happen. I don't think so, because that's that's what we do. In, <laughs> in the middle of budget season that's, it's already on the agenda okay um sure that can that can be uh the motion then that we that we would vote on to table until the next meeting okay any discussion on that motion Seeing none. Night. Wait, sorry, Member Agna, and then <laughs> Member Davis. Could you just repeat it one more time? Because I've lost track. It's just a table at this point. Just a table. Okay. Okay. Member Davis, did you have the same question or a different one? Well, um, I, I guess my question is um, logistical question. What kind of time? It's pretty tight then, right? To, to think of other alternatives of for the budget committee, and then um, because there are deadlines of when this has to be approved and voted on and finally gotten to. Does does it? it I I guess I'm wondering. Um, and as we always say at this hour, you know, things get a little fuzzier too. To, to judge, but is it, 
with all due respect to the to the motion is is there a school of thought that it's kicking the can down the road of we like we have with less time to really talk in a quality conversation about what would be the best thing to do or would it be the best thing to do i'm i'm just dr provost were you going to respond to that i was just going to speak to the timeline pieces by the charter it needs to be passed by april 15th so it will definitely have to be passed on April 14th if it's not passed tonight. Okay. Um, any further discussion on the motion to table to the, um, so it would be tabling it to April 14th for a full vote, but would uh, be at the budget subcommittee on the 31st, yes? Okay, seeing no further discussion, roll call please, roll call, please Annie. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor, Sch Mayor Schiara. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. And Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Okay. Um, we are moving on to item D, which is a vote to refer the embedded honors math program to the curriculum subcommittee for review. Um, Dr. Provost. And actually member Levy had requested this, so. Oh, yes. Member Levy, would you like to speak to it? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so in our next meeting, when you can hear the report from the curriculum subcommittee, you'll get to read our charge that we're gonna present to you. But one of the, one of the purposes of the subcommittee is to be able to engage in a dialogue with uh, folks, uh, specifically teachers, um, to get a, um, a really clear sense of, of what's going on curricularly, what their feelings are, what they think is best for us to be able to bring that to you all. Um, given the conversation around embedded honors and how heightened that has become since we last said we would have that conversation with the full committee. And given the what I think is the intention of all of us, which is to have a highly respect, um, respected uh, conversation where, where we are centering the expertise of the, of the department and um, really doing our best to hear from them, um, I wanna recommend or put forward that rather than, as we had previously decided, um, have the conversation about embedded honors at the high school as a full committee, that we start at the subcommittee where I hope we can have um, more of a, uh, I, I'm sure the conversation would be collegial here as well, but, but where it, it may be a little bit, feel a little bit less pressured and formal, um, and then we can bring that back to the committee. So sorry, that was long-winded to say I, I'm proposing that, or I'm making a motion to refer the embedded honors math conversation to the curriculum subcommittee for our next conversation, also in hopes that that'll allow us to have it a bit faster as well. That part wasn't a part of the, the motion, just another reason for it. Okay, motion's been made and seconded okay. by. Tell me who that was. Uh, me. Emily. Oh, okay. Seconded by Member Sarafi Cox. Um, and I see hands. So Member Agna. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what Member Levy just said and emphasize the fact that this is, should be collegial and respectful and centering the professionals. I noted in the, that previous discussion that there was a public comment about 
my being, um, def- I don't know, wanting the professionals on the alt team to be honored, but I, uh, the person wanted to make sure that we were honoring the teacher's expertise as well or something like that. And I'm really concerned that the there's still misinformation out there about what the curriculum subcommittee is all about, that we're not there to micromanage and we're not there to conduct some kind of um, review of, of how teachers are teaching or what they're teaching. So I don't want to get too cranky about it, but it does bother me that this continues to be um, some kind of misinformation. And I think the, the way the even the uh, vote on letter C says that it would be referred to the subcommittee for review might get people to think we were asking them to come so we would review it and decide whether it was something to approve. It's not for that reason. And I think what we'd like to do is really help the math department feel that we're supportive of them and and also in understanding where this controversy is and hopefully be able to communicate to the public what the intention of the professionals is in this. So I just want to make sure if nobody's here now on the screen, but I would like to make sure that the understanding is that we are not having it referred to our committee so that we can approve it or review it or make some kind of um, micromanaging attempt at it. We're really there to have a collegial conversation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Stein. Thanks. I um, I had some questions for. Um, Meg, who I believe is the chair of the curriculum committee, I had made a sim- the same motion that Dean uh, Member Levy made tonight originally. Um, and at that time, Member Robbins um, did not think that was the best idea. So I- I'm, I'm wanting to hear her thoughts on that. And maybe that's what her hand is up about. But I do also want to... Um, comment that I think that um, this is sort of appreciating what member Agna is saying about the way things are becoming or can become further misinterpreted um, is that there's some daylight between the, what I mean by daylight is there's a difference between um, understanding from the teachers uh, pedagogical decision around embedded honors or what's working and what's not and what could be improved or Etc. Learning more, and um, a separate concern, which is about representations made to the committee about the program, and that's a different thing, right? And that's not a micromanaging thing. That's not a question of the expertise of the math department. That's not even a conversation about whether or not embedded honors should be the thing. It's a question about representations made to the previous school committee um, and representations made to this school committee. Um, and that's a conversation that I want the whole school committee to have. I'm not sure if part of that happens in the subcommittee, but I do think they are potentially two different conversations. They could be the same, but I think conflating it um, risks uh, a lot of um, unnecessary, and I think m- missing the mar- it just misses the mark on what this curriculum com- committee subcommittee is trying to do and this other issue. So I just want to keep those two things distinct. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear from uh, Member Robbins. Member Robbins. I did it. <laughs> Yay, me. Um, yeah, at the time when that was presented, it really felt like it was a really messy mix of both those things. It's really hard to have there be newspaper headlines with people's names in it. and. Um, have conversations that aren't really heated. And when our job is to talk about, so what happened and how can we support you in getting to where you want to be with it? um, And how's it working? And it's really about process. So we had talked a little bit um, about bringing it back to the curriculum subcommittee. And I would be okay with that. But I think that it's a longer term conversation than something that is a priority because we've already passed the program of studies. The courses are in there for next year. 
And I think we also need some time to pay attention to the other things that are important. Teachers definitely do at this point. And there'll be more data at the end of the school year about how that worked this year for kids that were actually in school doing embedded honors. They will have had a couple of semesters with it. So we, I was going to suggest to our subcommittee if it came back, and I guess I'd wanna have that be an understanding that we actually think about working with Karen Albano and the teachers involved in talking about having an ad hoc study group around that. Um, I, we were really impressed to hear Karen talk yesterday about the work she's done in math at the elementary schools and also moving forward to uh, looking at the middle school. And it was very informative. And it, that way may, may well be something that's happening at the high school as well, but we are yet unaware of it. And that conversation would be good, but it should be um, a learning experience together. And it would be really appreciated if it does get sent back to our subcommittee, if there was some support for possibly creating that ad hoc study group together and not really having to have it be a rush. So the results of that would be that we'd have a, a meeting schedule that would be something we could bring back to our look at the program of studies when supposedly we're gonna get it earlier in the year next year. Thank you, Member Levy. Thanks. I guess in my mind, I, you know, while I would potentially support an ad hoc committee that is looking deeper into, I, I guess I'm not quite sure what that committee would do, but I think whatever next steps would be would depend on, on what the teachers are saying they need in terms of support and um, any other questions that we thought maybe needed to be answered that perhaps they couldn't answer. Uh, like bigger, bigger curricular questions. I'm not sure. I guess I, I, I'm not prepared to say yes or no, because I think first we've got to have the conversation with the teachers and I do want to, but certainly would be open to it if, if that is the direction it would need to go. Um, I, I want to echo what, or I guess agree to what member Stein was saying that, yes, I think um, there are two very different issues here. One was the way that the, that the, um, program of studies was presented. And I think that is something that we will talk about as a full committee, my understanding is in executive session. Uh, and that that is different from the actual um, support at what, what the math teachers see as the benefits of embedded honors, um, how they feel prepared to differentiate within the course, how it's going, what the challenges are, what kind of support they might need, um, what kind of funding they might need, which would come from this committee. I think all of those are, are questions that the subcommittee could engage with, with the, the department members in, uh, in a way that, that I think, as you know, Member Robbins, Karen is, comes to our, our subcommittee meeting, so would, would be a part of it as well. Okay, thank you. Can I respond to that? Uh, sure. Okay, because I am concerned. My other concern was that it's going to eat up our time, and that it's it, re, it deserves time on its own. And we have other a lot of other things that are really our priorities that people have come to us with, or that this group might um, assign to us because it seems like a comfortable place to send things at this point. And I don't want to see one one thing get pushed aside for another um, when it's already in effect and it's going to happen. So. I guess if somebody can define for me the parameters of how fast that would need to happen and when those meetings would occur, I would be really open to it, I guess. Do you mean how fast the embedded honors conversation with the math department would need to happen? Yeah, because it could take, that could take, meeting after meeting, we only meet once a month. And there are other issues that really do seem to be priorities that folks have come to us and, and um, habits of work in mind that we're trying to develop within the committee too, about making it be a, a place that has space to hear from folks about best practices that they're bringing to us. Yeah, I mean, I guess when I look at our charge, this is that we haven't shared with the committee yet. This is, this is in line with our charge. Uh, and I don't, I guess I don't necessarily see it taking meeting after meeting. I would hope it would be a fairly succinct conversation. 
And I think it is one that needs to happen pretty soon. <clears throat> Any other comments? Okay, I don't see any. So roll call, please, Annie. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Spira. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. And Member Stein. Yes. Okay. Um, moving on to E, vote to ratify the chance MOA. Uh, Member Serafi Cox. Uh, apologies, I uh, had to take my dog out <laughs> so that she could uh, use the outdoors. Um, which which of the of the MOAs is first? The first one, Lachance. Lachance. Okay, so um, I would um, make a motion to ratify um, the Lachance MOA, uh, which has already been ratified in executive session. Um, and uh, supports Ms. LaChance's uh, um, education. I second it. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call please, Annie. Member Levy. Oh, sorry, not Member Levy. I started the wrong one. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Scarra. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. And Member Levy. Yes. Okay, that's been ratified and on to vote to ratify psych evaluation MOA, Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Um, I would make a motion to ratify the psych evaluation MOA, um, which also like the previous MOA uh, has already been ratified in executive session. Um, and uh, uh, it provides a, uh, an opportunity for um, school psychologists um, um, around uh, evaluations and uh, well, Folks can 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 read it. I guess I don't need to explain it all. And we have already <laughs> ratified it once anyway. Uh, so that the motion is to uh, is to ratify this in public session. Thank you. Seconded by. I can second it. Uh, Member uh, Goldman, I think it's in there. Um, any discussion? Seeing none. Roll call, please, Annie. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Sciarra. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. And Member Miller. Yes. Okay, that's been ratified. And next on the agenda are um, the future business and meeting dates. So negotiating subcommittee, Tuesday, March 29th at 5 p.m. Budget and property subcommittee, Thursday, March 31st at 11 a.m. Uh, rules and policy subcommittee, Wednesday, April 6th at 4 p.m. Curriculum subcommittee, Wednesday, April 13th at 5 p.m. And school committee meeting with student advisory council, that's Thursday, April 14th at 6 p.m. Um, we now are gonna go into executive session. Um, we will be adjourning from that executive session, so we will not be coming back into um, an open public meeting. Is there a motion? So request? Sorry, can you do the, say the magic oh. word? 
Do you want me to read the yes, please. executive? Yes, no problem. Thank you. Unless anyone else wants to. <laughs> okay. Uh, so request to enter executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A Section 21A2 to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Second. And seconded. Um, any discussion on that? Maybe we don't discuss it. Uh, roll call, please, Annie. Member Agnes. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Skira. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. Okay, thank you everyone who joined us this evening. Again, we will be adjourning from executive session and not coming back into the public meeting. So we will be saying good night to uh, everybody who's not on the committee.